All right, folks, let's do this. Um, so this kind of got spurned out of um, a talk that I'm going to be giving, so I needed to practice giving this talk, so you can't think that I'm totally doing it for you. I have to be honest. But it's something that comes back on student evaluations every year um, at the uh, on the graduation exit interviews that you'd like an ID review before you go on residency or um, before you went into APPs, before you go into practice before boards, etc. So I figured we'd uh, kill two birds with one stone. Um, I appreciate you guys being here. Um, that's why I have the feedback sheets. Like anything that you see that's not clear or that you think I can do a better job explaining, please just write that down and write it down as we go along. Um, at any point that you need to leave today or you feel like I am doing an awful job and it's not worth your time, please go. It's a beautiful day. Um, I did not anticipate that uh, when I scheduled. So, um, most of it is just a conglomeration of lectures that I do in pharmacotherapy and some other CE stuff that I've done. Uh, some of it I haven't reviewed in a while, so it could be a little rough at times, um, but just bear with me. Sound good? All right, and questions, you know, just as you feel um, they come up. All right. Great. So we've got all these antibiotics, right? And then we've got more antibiotics, but we've got more antibiotics, and it's tough to keep them all straight, which is why you guys are here, right? But this is one of the reasons that I like IDs, because there's a lot to remember, and there's a lot of pathogens to talk about, um, and we're just going to go through and do a quick review. Um, of the antibiotics through their mechanism of action, uh, side effects, um, what spectrum of bacteria they're going to be useful against, and then go into the pathogens uh, specifically and try to make a correlation there. So major mechanisms of action, we've got the cell wall inhibitors, the protein synthesis, synthesis inhibitors, your folate antagonists, and then your DNA gyrase uh, inhibitors. So for the most part, all of your cell wall inhibitors are going to be bacterial cycles. Okay, um, because they're acting on the cell wall, causing disruption of that cell, so the cell, the bacteria is actively going to die. Versus your protein synthesis inhibitors, most of those are going to be static because they're just inhibiting um, growth of new DNA, so they can't replicate themselves. So it's just going to prevent the bacteria from growing and expanding in the body. Um, your folate antagonists, uh, so bacterium is basically the only one that falls in there. Uh, that is going to be cytal, and then your DNA gyrase inhibitor, the fluoroquinolone, is cytal as well. So a big group of antibiotics is the beta-lactams. They all share that uh, beta-lactam structure that's right here in the middle. Uh, so this is the guy that we're worried about. You can see that the monobactams look pretty similar, although they don't have that fourth side chain coming off the beta-lactam ring. Um, so they're beta-lactams, but monobactams. Uh, so beta-lactam-like, but not totally beta-lactam. And then we've got these different generations of penicillin, starting with the natural penicillins, which we don't really use anymore, so that'd be PIN-VK, PIN-G. Um, moving on through the anti-pseudomonal extended spectrum, um, penicillin, so your piperacillin and ticarcillin uh, down here at the bottom, which we generally will uh, put with the beta-lactamase in order to expand their um, spectrum. Then all of your cephalosporins, which I think that's the place that I had the most trouble as a student, was cephalosporins. Like, keeping them straight, what falls where, and I still have to review those, especially like second and third generation, they just seem like a mess to me, so we'll hopefully provide some clarification there, uh, carbapenems and then uh, monobactam again. So beta-lactam um, antibiotics, they act on the penicillin binding protein. So what is the penicillin binding protein? Well, it's the peptidoglycan um, little enzyme that actually attaches uh, lines of uh, the cell wall together. So it actually forms the cell wall of the bacterial cell. Um, so up here, we've got all these NAGs and NAMs that uh, make the cell wall so that enzymes can't come through it, right? And then you've got these little um, amino acid chains that come off of the NAM. And what the penicillin binding protein or the transpeptidase does is it takes those two strands from the different lines and puts them together so that they can stay bound together and you can actually have a cell wall that goes around the bacteria. So if you add in a beta-lactam antibiotic, what it's going to do is it's going to come in, it's going to attach to the penicillin binding protein, the transpeptidase, and it's going to block it up so it can't go in and make those attachments. All right? and so what that does is it weakens the cell wall. Um, what it also does when it binds to that penicillin binding protein, what it does is it creates this cascade of effects that occurs 
in which uh, there's all these lysozymes that start acting, and they start lysing down the cell wall. So that's really where it becomes uh, bacteriocidal, and you get actual cell breakdown. And as you start to um, destabilize the cell wall itself, that's when um, like there's different osmotic pressures that start to come in. So you've got your sodium chloride that can come in easier, um, your potassium that can come in easier, your hydrogen that can come in easier. What it does is it creates this osmotic imbalance where the inside of the cell wall, actually, the inside of the cell actually just straight up explodes. Okay, so it causes explosions of cells, which is awesome, right? Okay, so we like when uh, bacterial cells uh, explode in our bodies because then we feel better. Now there is a big difference between your gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria in terms of how um, the beta lactam antibiotics work, and that has to do. Um, with the structure of the bacterial cells. So what's the big difference between gram-positive and gram-negative that you guys remember? Yes? Gram-negative have a, um, uh, they have a thinner compared to white hand layer, they also have an outer membrane. Right. Well, gram-positives have a thick outer layer of the white gland and no outer layer. Right, so the gram-negatives actually have like two or three strains only of this peptidoglycan um, cell wall, per se. And then it's got this big old fatty lipophilic or lipoprotein outer wall. Um, and so the beta lactam antibiotic actually has to go through a porin into uh, the middle layer of the cell wall, and then it can act on the peptidoglycan. Versus your gram positive bacteria, it's just got this thick old, like 50 to 60 strand uh, peptidoglycan cell wall on the outside that it has to slowly break down, but it doesn't have to get through a porin in order to cause that effect. So generally it's gonna be more effective against gram-positive pathogens versus gram-negative pathogens, which is why you know, we generally will use um, beta-lactams for strep and staph versus like your interbacter ECA, um, where we use some other antibiotics for those. Um, and then when we get to resistance a little bit later, uh, we'll come back to this and talk about how our resistance will play into the fact that there's differences in the cell wall as well. Cool. I was pretty impressed with my Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> it took me a while, but it was well worth it. Okay, so beta lactans, uh, we just talked about the mechanisms of action. They're binding to penicillin binding proteins. Um, they're all cytal. Resistance is primarily through the beta lactamase production. So they come out, uh, they cleave the beta lactam ring that the beta lactam antibiotic has that actually um, encodes for its activity. Uh, we see that mostly in the gram-negative pathogens, and then there's alteration of the penicillin binding protein that happens with gram-positive pathogens. So it's through two different mechanisms of re uh, resistance that we see resistance with beta-lactams to the different um, gram-positive and gram-negative uh, gram pathogens. So with alteration of the penicillin binding protein, these usually point mutations on the DNA, DNA uh, such that the um, structure of the penicillin binding protein is slightly altered in such a way that the beta lactam can't bind to the peptidoglycan. Uh, so it just looks a little bit different. Yeah. All right, so we've got all these different penicillins. Lots of them, kind of. But we're only going to use a few of them, so that makes it easier. Uh, natural penicillins, gosh, I don't know. I wouldn't even spend time <coughs> thinking about those. Really just syphilis. Um, the amino penicillins, uh, so they're the next generation down. Uh, we're going to use both ampicillin and amoxicillin. What's the big difference between those two and their uses? Did you guys can speak up? Yeah, so ampicillin, we're going to use more IV. Amoxicillin is going to be our uh, PO version. Uh, and that comes down to bioavailability. We get higher concentrations orally with the amoxicillin versus the ampicillin. Um, it's a little bit better tolerated um, in terms of side effects as well uh, with the oral administration. And then uh, we're going to pair those up with beta-lactamase inhibitors uh, to help uh, specifically with our gram negative pathogens and our staph aureus, uh, make sure we get good coverage there. Otherwise, if we've got a straight strep uh, iosine, strep pneumoniae, and there's some resistance uh, encoded there, uh, then still antacillin and amoxicillin by itself are going to be fine because our strep resistance is primarily due to the penicillin binding protein alteration. So we, the beta-lactamase inhibitor is going to help with that. Um, it's only when there's beta lactamase is being produced that the inhibitor is going to work. Um, it's also, I think I'm going to get to this in a second, but I'm going to go ahead and say it here because repetition isn't bad. Uh, the sulbactam and the clavulonate component, the beta lactamase inhibitors, they don't have antibiotic activity. 
They basically go to the beta lactamases that are being produced, bind it up, it has a higher affinity for the beta lactamases, so it binds those up and makes it so that those uh, will be unable to come out and actually eat up the amoxicillin and the ampicillin, except for solbactam. Solbactam has activity against acinito, acinito bomani, uh, which is a really nasty pathogen. Um, so it's kind of strange that it doesn't have antibacterial activity except for a really mean and resistant bacteria. So um, that's one of those like just strange things to remember. Um, our anti-staphs, uh, this is where we uh, determine uh, methicillin resistant versus methicillin sensitive. So methicillin is what we used to use historically. It was the first anti-staph penicillin that came out. Uh, so now we refer to everything as methicillin sensitive or methicillin resistant. Uh, but we don't use it anymore, not even for testing. Then the oxicillin is what we test in the laboratory. So when we look at our cultures and sensitivities, <coughs> the oxicillin is what we look at for resistance or sensitivity. And then the nasone is what we actually use to treat. But what? And then the dicloxicillin is our oral form of that. Um, so these, this class is going to be directed therapy for MSSA. Okay. Um, Pripsilin, ticarcillin. Uh, very broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, the main thing here is that we pick up gram negative activity. So as we move through the penicillins, what we do is we get better staph coverage. Okay, so we work from penicillins, which quickly no staph activity. Amino penicillins had some staph activity, and now it's gone, but still pretty good strep coverage versus your natural penicillins really don't have that great of strep coverage anymore. Your anti-staphs pick up the staph. Um, and then your extended spectrum penicillins actually pick up the pseudomonas. So those are the big differentiations there. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. So the ones on the further down the list, are they covered in the same species? Mode? Yeah, yeah. So you're basically just getting better drug as you progress through. Yeah, you're not losing anything. Um, like pipicillin versus penicillin, there's nothing that penicillin covers that pipicillin doesn't. One small differentiation to that one caveat. Okay. Nafcillin, dicloxacillin, your anti staph penicillins, far superior anti staph coverage versus penicillin. Far superior. Drug choice. What was yes. the name of that bacteria that only sold staph films? The okay. acinetobacter, A C I N O bacter. Yep, and it's Bomani. Isn't there a kid in your guys' class? Huh? Yeah, the Gami. <laughs> but this one's Bomani. Yeah. All right. All right, so natural penicillins, gosh, just like don't even worry about these guys. Syphilis is the main thing uh, that we're going to use it for. Um, yeah, no gram negative coverage because it can't get through the foreign channel because it's not lipophilic enough. So that foreign that allows access into the peptidyl glycan cell wall of the gram negative pathogen, it can't get through that cell wall. So it's really relegated to gram positives, uh, spiral sheets. But in terms of an antibiotic, uh, not really going to be used too often. One of the main things you do need to remember though is as far as the IV and IM. Uh, injectables is that when we put it with the benzathine, with that really lipophilic uh, salt that it goes with, you cannot give that IV. It's going to cause death. So don't do that. Um, otherwise, millions of units, uh, kind of an outpatient drug every once in a while is an IM injectable for uh, sexually transmitted infections. Again, so our anti-staphs, methicillin, oxicillin, really just for naming purposes and laboratory purposes, but the nafcillin and dicloxicillin are what we're using for actual treatment. Nafcillin IV. Uh, these have very short half-lives, so we have to do a lot of dosing with these, so it really impairs our use of the drug. Generally, the nafcillin is going to give us a continuous infusion, uh, just because it <coughs> makes no sense to set up an IV line, take like 20 minutes to get that IV set up, run it for four hours, do it all over again. It's just Far easier to set up a 12 hour bag, let that run over 12 hours, start a new bag after 12 hours, um, and just give the continuous infusion there. Um, MSSA infection, so specifically bacteremias, um, is going to be our main use here. Uh, when we compare it to vancomycin, right, we're going to use vancomycin empirically for staph infections. 
once we see that it's MSSA, we want to de-escalate down to the mast zone or the cefazolin because the beta lactam is far superior for staph coverage, even versus vancomycin. Vancomycin broader, uh, but not as effective in its treatment of staph organs. Um, mm -hmm, uh -huh, yes, yeah, so that. Okay, so that. Uh, resistance to the, the PVPs, and so that's what actually uses MRSA is it's an alteration of the penicillin binding protein that makes methicillin resistant. Um, makes the bacteria staph resistant to methicillin. That actually started about a year after methicillin came out. So methicillin comes out in 1960. 1961, we got the first case of methicillin resistance. It was over in Greece. This dude named like Tim or something. So that's where we get this Tim as a uh, PVP alteration gene that actually causes MRSA. He got named after, but he died. All famous people. That's how it happens, right? All right. <laughs> Nastillin, uh, better clearance, induced. Oh, this is really important for our warfarin patients. It induces 3A4, so it makes it more active. So most of our antibiotics make INR go up. Well, this actually makes INR go down because it induces the metabolism of warfarin, so we don't have as much of the active drug hanging around, uh, so we don't see as high of a, um, an INR on this, not as much clotting inhibition. So that's one of those reverse things. So you see, not someone get started, they're on warfarin, you're going to need to bump up their warfarin dose. Generally about 50%. Hot sauce. You know, penicillin, we've talked about this. Uh, okay. So it is water soluble, which allows it to go through those pores so that extends its spectrum out to the gram negative pathogens. Um, we can use it in enterococcus. Uh, if it's a bacterine, okay, so how does this work? Let me think. Okay, so what enterococcus does on its cellular membrane, it has some channels as well that epsilon can't quite permeate really, really well. So the concentrations that it achieves within the enterococcus pathogen aren't super high. So a lot of times, even though it's cytal against enterococcus in vivo, it actually becomes more of a static agent. And so you have to add on a synergistic agent, aminoglycoside, <coughs> in order to provide that actual uh, bactericidal activity. When you have enterococcus uh, endocarditis or enterococcus bacteremia, you want to add on the aminoglycoside there. Now, if it's an enterococcus UTI, um, just using epsilon by itself is going to be fine because it concentrates so heavily into the urine that your concentrations against that pathogen uh, will be high enough to just use epsilon by itself. Sarah! Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Um, what else? Great. Oh, um, so I've got here extends coverage to more gram negative uh, rods and anaerobes with the beta lactamase inhibitor. So we do pick up anaerobes in a lot of cases with the beta lactamase inhibitor. Specifically, what's our, when we say anaerobes, what do we mean? Bacteroides. So it picks up Bacteroides fragilis. So the anaerobic coverage in terms of your beta lactamase inhibitor is going to be the Bacteroides. Uh, so the uh, augmentin and unison pick up uh, anaerobes, specifically Bacteroides. Oh, perfect segue. Uh, they mimic the structure, so beta lactamase inhibitors mimic the structure of uh, beta lactam. They bind irreversibly, so they have a high affinity for your beta lactamases. So they just go, they attach, they chill. Uh, clavulonic for amoxicillin and tacrocillin, sulbactam uh, is for epsilon. There's your acinetobacter activity with the sulbactam. Uh, and then your tazobactam, uh, which you guys have been on rotations. You know, we put this in the water at hospitals, uh, just Zosin. What? They got a fever, give them Zosin. Why count? Zosin. They're sick, Zosin. All right, it's a very broad spectrum. The only thing that we don't cover with Zosin is MRSA <coughs> and ESDLs and ATPs. Well, otherwise, it's covered everything else. Great. And I'm probably going to say this on the next slide. No? All right. Um, so this is just a reminder about the uh, oxacillin is what we show up for methicillin here. So you can see down there, uh, oxacillin 1 has an S, so it is sensitive. We would call that MSSA. Um, we're always going to use uh, like spazlin or anacillin in those cases where it's MSSA or an augmentin if you're going to do outpatient 
or cataplexic if you're going to do outpatient. So first generation cephalosporins, IV or PO, or um, anti-staph penicillins. Pepercillin, Tegazobactam, so I said most of this. Great for a mixed nosocomial infections because it picks up pseudomonas, so that's one of the things we're worried about for our nosocomial uh, pathogens. Um, it's also got good coverage of strep, uh, reasonable coverage of MSSA, no coverage of MRSA, uh, we don't get clostridium difficile, uh, no atypicals. What else did I say? So one of the things that you may have seen on rotations is this um, extended infusion zosin where we give it over four hours versus 30 minutes um, based on the drug profile in which uh, it is a time dependent killer. If we give the infusion over a longer period of time, we can maintain concentrations at a higher level uh, for a longer period of time so we can dose back our nosocomial infections, uh, specifically pneumonia from 4.5 grams down to 3.375 through <coughs> that Q8 versus Q6. Um, and so that really comes down to the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic profile of the drug. <clears throat> so 4.5, otherwise you like boards, remember 4.5 if it's pneumonia, 3.3 uh, uh, for every other indication, and then it does have a little bit of Ticarcillin, one of um, the things that inhibits its use as a broad spectrum anti pseudomonal penicillin is that it has this really high sodium content. Um, it's like three times as high as dosin. And so a lot of our patients that we see uh, are heart failure patients in the hospital, or we don't want to volume overload them, and when we add in a big salt component that we're giving four times a day, um, that can really volume overload them pretty quickly. And so that's one of the main reasons that uh, we don't use it. Uh, but what's really neat about it is it actually covers stenotrophomonas multophilia. Say it with me. Stenotrophomonas multophilia. Okay, so where do we see Stenotrophomonas multifilia? It's primarily a nosocomial pathogen picked up in ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, so it's a really nasty, wicked pathogen. Uh, and so we generally only have three antibiotics that will cover it, and Ticarcillin is one of those that will generally give us coverage of Stenotrophomonas. However, you always need to think back to them first for Stenotrophomonas. Uh, and its Pseudomonas coverage isn't quite as good as those. Yes. Uh, random question, but um, so I've seen Naxalin used more in the IV infusion. I've never seen Zosin. Is there a reason? Is it easier to get Naxalin? Or do you see it used a lot of IV? You mean like a continuous infusion? Yeah, just because um, Pepercillin's half life is so much longer than Naxalin, there's most of the time no need to give it as a continuous infusion. Um, the net versus the Naxalone, its half life is literally like two hours, and so that's why you have to do the Q4 um, dosing. Yep. Um, for the continuous infusion. So it really just comes down to half life on the drug, and it's got a longer half life. So that's one of the other things is we've got newer and newer penicillins, our half life, half lives expanded out as well. Um, I mean, these guys are relatively well tolerated, to be honest. And we <coughs> the are, not about many diarrhea are the main things. Uh, we do have to be worried about um, acute interstitial nephritis to a certain extent, and that's really more of an effusion reaction where we give high doses quickly as an effusion. We will see uh, interstitial nephritis, anaphylaxis. We always want to be cognizant of. We'll talk about allergies here in a little bit, and then um, decreased oral contraceptive effectiveness uh, with your penicillins. So, counseling point there. Uh, let's see here. Otherwise, again, the seizures is really going to be just because of uh, high concentrations that are achieved. So, we get too much of the drug, and someone who has renal impairments, or we just dose them too high. So, that's a big problem um, with uh, kind of down the line. We talk about our carbapenem, so imipenem, that's one of the things, miropenem. We have to make sure we dose adjust those. Uh, so it goes along with all beta lactams is the seizure risk. All right, drink. What was that uh, GI infection you were talking about? Um, the clostridium difficile or? No, it was another one. I don't think I came on it. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, all right, cephalosporins. Same mechanisms of action. They're binding penicillin binding proteins. That's why they're beta lactam. Uh, so same uh, mechanism of action. They are more stable against uh, the beta lactamases, though. So uh, that's why you never really see a cephalosporin paired with the beta lactamase. Never. Although there's one that's in kind of the last phase three stages <coughs> of coming out. Uh, so that'll be kind of interesting to see once it comes out. It'll be the first cephalosporin uh, paired with the beta lactamase uh, inhibitor. But stay, they stay uh, active against uh, beta lactamases. Their main resistance profile is through a penicillin binding protein alteration. Um, yeah, great. So that's cephalosporins in general. Uh, third generations have the best CNS penetration. So that's why meningitis, we say we see rocephin as the drug choice there. Um, yeah, boom. So as we progress through first generations through fourth generations, what we see is this increase in gram-negative coverage. So our first set of sports, really great gram-positive coverage. Um, Spasma and Keflex, again, are our drug choices for MSSA. As we move through the generations, we pick up extend, extended gram-negative coverage. Cephalosporin has pseudomonas. Uh, Ceftazidine has pseudomonas coverage as well, so that's our mean gram-negative. Uh, and then the new guy, the ceftaroline, really messes up my chart. Not happy with him. So he picks up MRSA, right? And so you would actually cause it, think of it like up by the first generation because it's got extended gram positive <laughs> coverage. So it doesn't really fit this gram positive and gram negative. So stop at fourth generation with extended gram negative because it doesn't cover pseudomonas. Other key things to remember about cephalosporins is none of them cover MRSA except ceftaroline. So the new guy covers MRSA, nothing else covers MRSA. The other thing is enterococcus. None of the cephalosporins cover enterococcus, except for the new guy. He covers enterococcus facium, just, no, fake callus, sorry, fake callus. So he just covers the easy one, all right? So fake callus is easy, or facile is easy in Spanish, fake callus is the easy enterococcus. Um, yep, great. Second generation, slight difference here. Um, <coughs> we'll talk about it when we get there, but note that your cefoxetin and cefotetin actually have bacteroides coverage. None of your other cephalosporins have anaerobic coverage, so it's just those two guys that cover anaerobic, so they're used for GI uh, procedure prophylaxis in a lot of cases. And then cefuroxine, cefalcor, and cefprozole have extended spectrum activity against Haemophilus and Fluenzae. So within the second generation, there's actually differences in those drugs which is noxious. This is why no one understands cephalosporins. All right, first generation, anti-staph, poor H flu activity. So that's why we don't use the first generation cephalosporins for upper respiratory infections in many cases. Uh, we started giving the pneumococcal vaccination, so we see less strep pneumonia as an upper respiratory infection. Uh, we see more H influenza, uh, if there's an upper respiratory infection, we're not going to use cephalosporins as an empiric therapy in most cases unless there's some kind of allergy or intolerance that inhibits the use. Um, Spaslin, pre-op prophylaxis, you guys have seen ANSAF 1 gram, pre-op, uh, and then a couple doses following, and that's primarily because we're, we've got um, cutting of skin, pathogens on the skin are staph epi, Staph aureus, so there's increased risk of having those guys infiltrate and cause a bacteremia. So we give the uh, spasin as a prophylaxis against those two gram positive um, pathogens. And then, really, Keflex, because it has um, a longer half life, it's replaced by cloxicillin for the most case in terms of our outpatient use against uh, cellulitis or MSSA. So, we don't, you guys haven't really seen that cloxicillin prescribed where you guys are. I, I don't think I've ever seen that. I've recommended it and they've gone out a couple times with it, but uh, for the most part, it's uh, Keflex that we're going to be using uh, there for MSSA as an outpatient treatment. So on the $4 list, great. <coughs> Second gens. I wish they would just get rid of them. All right, so our PO options are the ones that we use for upper respiratory infections. They actually pick up the Haemophilus influenzae coverage and the MCATRALIS. 
Uh, so a little bit extended gram negative coverage there with those guys. So remember, as we're going from first generation to fourth generation, more gram negative coverage. So specifically when we hit second generation, we're picking up uh, fluenza and cataralis. And that is primarily due to a small alteration in the <coughs> structure of the cephalosporin that allows it to uh, um, get through some beta-lactamases that are being produced uh, by those two pathogens. Um, so when we're talking about beta-lactamases, do realize that there's just not a beta-lactamase. There's a ton of different beta-lactamases that can be produced. Uh, so this gets through a couple of that uh, H. and M. chiralis uh, produced. Uh, and then we primarily are going to be using uh, Prozil versus Cephalocor. Uh, and that is due to the ELF in which uh, Cephalocor has. So it's the epithelial lining fluid penetration. ELF, epithelial lining, lung penetration, fluid, lung fluid penetration. Uh, and so Cephalocor does a better job of uh, concentrating there uh, than does Cephalocor. Uh, Okay, so within second generation, we've got the IV options, which are also referred to as the cephalomycins, and that's due to the R chain that it has on its uh, structure that allows it to actually pick up some uh, bacteroides. And you can see uh, cefoxin has a lower rate of resistance against bacteroides, 6%. So that's why you'll more commonly see it used uh, versus CFOT. Uh, it has a higher rate of resistance there. These guys do have that NMTT random abbreviation that you guys will see from time to time when we're reading about INR elevations and cephalosporins. Uh, those two have it so they can increase the INR and get you some disulfiram reactions. So it's due to this side chain that alters the way the drug looks a little bit um, and alters the way that it interacts with the warfarin and so you can have some INR increases with those guys. Um, yeah. And then my little note here, Abdominal infections is the main thing uh, that we say as advantageous with those uh, cephalomycins. So it will, those cephalosporins, cephalotin, the place that you will most commonly see them is at is as GI, GU prophylaxis for surgery. generation. Here we're picking up some more gram-negative pathogens. Uh, maintain pretty, uh, pretty consistent coverage of all of our strep species. Maybe a little bit of a decrease in your uh, consistency with staph aureus coverage, um, but you just want to check your susceptibility if you get a staph aureus pathogen back as to whether or not um, receptin would work there. Awesome advantage is it's once daily, no real adjustments. It's got this really long half-life. It penetrates the blood-brain barrier. Um, so that's we use it for uh, meningitis. In meningitis, we are using it for its strep coverage. It's not for the gram-negative coverage. Uh, specifically, when we think about meningitis, there are very few gram-negative pathogens that we're actually looking for in a meningitis uh, type of uh, presentation. So rosethin is uh, being added there because we know it penetrates the blood-brain barrier and we know it gets consistent coverage of strep, which is a big cause of meningitis. Uh, then we up the dose to that 2 gram Q12, and that's the only time we really use that 2 gram uh, Q12. So that's one of those things that you just want to like permanent marker in your head uh, if you're going to be inpatient wise. 2 gram Q12 with rosethin. Um, crystal formation, biliary sludging, big problems uh, with rosethin. What it does is it has a tendency to bind up uh, calcium and form little micro crystals, which end up chilling in the um, liver and so it backs up everything in the liver so you can't process toxins as well. Um, it's also in uh, the liver where we conjugate bilirubin, right? Uh, and so if you're blocking up conjugation of bilirubin then you're going to have a buildup of bilirubin out in the blood. Buildup of bilirubin in the blood causes jaundice. Take a breath, you okay? <laughs> okay, you got a buildup of bilirubin in the blood. Um, and then that can lead uh, to pernicterus in infants and neonates, which is why we don't use rosetin in neonates, okay? We use the cephotaxin in neonates, so we need a third generation cephotaxin. 
primarily do that <coughs> calcium bind up. We use a lot of calcium products in neonates, and so just avoid rosefin at all costs uh, in your neonates. So, this subotoxin doesn't bind up. <coughs> no, it doesn't bind up that calcium. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, you covered the streptococci, asymphalonsae, mm -hmm. and heteralis, which are upper respiratory bugs of uh, primary concern. Um, and so from an outpatient standpoint, you guys may see some ceftidoxin, some ceftonir um, that would uh, mimic your rosefin from an inpatient basis, right? And that's usually what we see is cephalosporins on for pediatric upper respiratory infections. Um, mix up those liquids, uh, have fun with that. We were just talking about augmentin the other day and how it smells so good and you love getting ear infections so you can get the augmentin yeah. smell like bubble gum. Mmm, delicious. All right, ceftazidine. Uh, so it is third generation, but it doesn't really act like a third generation like the rest of the guys. It, for whatever reason, it wants to be different. Um, and so it picks up anti-pseudomonal activity. So great for pseudomonas, but it loses a lot of strep coverage. So it's, it's like moving towards fourth generation, but it's still structurally similar to a third generation. So that's why we have the line that separates it. Out. Uh, so it is primarily going to be used for anti-pseudomonas coverage, gram-negative coverage, uh, not really used for its gram-positive coverage. Fourth and fifth generation. So Cephapim, like when they marketed it, like the commercials were all like, the max because it was maxipine, because it covered everything basically as a cephalosporin. So you got staph, you got strep, you got anti-pseudomonal activity. It has very broad spectrum activity um, that it encodes for. It doesn't, still doesn't cover intercoccus or MRSA or anaerobes. But, I mean, that's kind of similar to what we think of with Zosin, right? It's kind of in that same broad spectrum activity as you get with Zosin. But no intercoccus, no MRSA, no anaerobes. Uh, we do have to really adjust it uh, because we have that concern for seizures get those really high concentrations. Uh, it does penetrate the blood-brain barrier, so those um, concerns get um, more con uh, more concerned. Right. Uh, <coughs> what else do we want to say here? Oh, febrile neutropenia is really it's going to be its primary use. Uh, when you look at the guidelines for febrile neutropenia, it is the drug recommended. Uh, that's due to its nosocomial pathogen coverage. Uh, it's also cidal, uh, so neutropenia. The main thing that we want to remember about any patient that's neutropenia is you want cidal antibiotics on because they're not able to mount their own immune response. Their uh, neutrophils are down, that's why they're neutropenic, so they don't have any white blood cells or bacteriophages or um, natural born killer cells to come in and uh, kill off the bacteria. So we are totally reliant on the antibiotic itself to cause that killing. So uh, bactericidal is very important there. <coughs> And then fifth generation, the new guy on the block, I kind of call him like 0 0.5, 0 0.5 generation. You got the MRSA coverage, ANSAF coverage, it's like pre-first generation, no pseudomonas coverage, uh, ESBL coverage or acinito uh, factor coverage. But what it does is this mechanism action hits on that PPP2A, which is the alteration of the penicillin binding protein that causes uh, methicillin resistance. Um, so we get activity there. We really haven't figured out where to use it yet because um, it covers MRSA, but we've got a lot of other drugs that cover MRSA. Uh, its main advantage is that it's twice a day with no therapeutic drug monitoring. So if you have some onobacomycin that you're treating like an MRSA infection, it's going to be a long therapy. You know, that may be something uh, that you would use on an outpatient basis, but it's still pretty sinking costly, uh, so trying to figure out exactly where it fits because it's really only approved for community acquired pneumonia, like seriously, and um, bacterial skin and soft tissue infections. So, uh, place and therapy is still questionable. Is this a level PO? Uh, just that a floor. You're okay. No, you're good. I have to ask those questions sometimes. All right, so in summary, first generation, Great against uh, gram positive and, uh, or gram positive staph strep. Second generation, we get the H flu um, and some of the bacteroides with the IVs. 
And then third generation, we really start to pick up some gram-negative activity. Um, Ceftazidine picks up uh, Pseudomonas. And then uh, fourth generation is Cefepime. It gives us really consistent <coughs> gram, uh, positive and gram-negative coverage. And then fifth generation, the Ceftarolin is the only one with that anti-MRSA uh, coverage. No intercoccus coverage on any of these guys. Okay? Don't use cephalosporins or intercoccus. They don't like cancer taking me longer to come in that box. But that's okay. We use them a lot. We need to spend time on them, right? All right, carbapenems. They act on the penicillin binding protein in their beta lactam. We have amlipenem, mirapenem, doropenem, which all act differently than erdipenem. So uh, we, we move erdipenem aside because it doesn't cover what that the rest of them do? Pseudomonas. So, uh, Doropenem, Mirapenem, Enopenem all get Pseudomonas coverage. Erdipenem does not. So it is Carbapenem, but it doesn't have Pseudomonas coverage. We want to reserve these guys whenever possible because they are the only drugs that give us consistent coverage of the extended spectrum beta lactamases. So our ESVLs. Uh, really, it is the most consistent coverage that we have there, so we really want to reserve their use for times that we need them. Um, what else do I want to say here? No MRSA, no atypical, no C. diff coverage, but otherwise pretty broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, you do pick up some intercoccus coverage uh, with them, so we can use them for uh, intercoccal uh, infections. And then, again, d uh, drug choice for our ASBLs. E. coli and Klebsiella and ammonia are the primary pathogens which encode for these extended spectrum beta-lactamases. And they're also the primary pathogens that we're starting to see that are resistant to carbapenems. So then code for the carbapenemases, CREs. And then uh, again, this renal dysfunction, the beta lactams, it's so important to be aware of renal dysfunction and dose reduced to prevent seizure occurrences within uh, those patients. And most specifically uh, with hemopenem, it has the highest seizure risk. Did I go to each one of these? All right, emopenem is the only one that has this um, additional guy on there. So we've got the silastatin. So, yeah, silastatin. Silastin. Thank you. Did I spell that right? For whatever reason, I thought it was silastatin. But anyway, it's got it on there. And that's the reason for that is because when emopenem goes into the body, when it's metabolized, it causes these nephrotoxic metabolites um, that then cause renal dysfunction. And so what uh, silastin does is it comes in and it inhibits those renal dihydropeptidases. Uh, and so then you get more imipenem as the, at, staying around as imipenem. You don't get the nephrotoxic metabolites. Uh, you don't have to worry about nephrotoxicity. It also extends out the half-life of imipenem uh, as well. So that's why it's the only one that has the uh, silastin on there. The rest of them have long half-lives. They don't get metabolized to the uh, uh, nephrotoxic metabolite. Meropenem has really taken over as a carbapenem of choice because it has a low seizure risk, it has a longer half-life, it's got more consistent coverage of pseudomonas as well, so that, um, it's a better anti-pseudomonal agent. Dorpenem, um, I'm not going to see its use uh, very much. It's primarily due to this new, uh, you can see March 6th, so this is really, really new. Um, communication that came out, risk uh, when used to treat pneumonia or ventilator-associated patients, we actually saw mortality higher in Dorapenem versus other agents. Uh, so most likely it's going to end up like a tagacycline where we just really don't use the drug. It's out there, it's broad spectrum, but we've seen increased mortality in these patients. Uh, we've got other carbapenems, uh, no, no reason to use it. Erdipenem, um, we lose the pseudomonas activity, no acinetobacter coverage, no enterococcus coverage. So it's really quite a bit different than the other <coughs> carbapenems. It does have the once a day dosing, which is super, super convenient. Um, but that shouldn't be the reason that we prescribe it like water. Um, we should really reserve its use to a confirmed ESBL pathogen 
in which they need outpatient therapy where we can give a once a day drug. Um, this use for GI infections is ridiculous uh, because we have combinations of flagell or Clinda that we can put together and put that with the Cipron with the same spectrum of activity that we get with Erdpenem without reducing um, more resistance uh, causing carbon releases. A, concur. <coughs> so just use for ESBLs. That's what you need to remember. They have a history of ESBL or confirmed ESBL, that's what we're using. Uh, our singular uh, monobactam, astrunam, it only has gram-negative activity. One of the main things you want to remember, only gram-negative activity. Uh, it doesn't have the beta-lactam cross-allergy um, precaution. Uh, so that's a lot of times where we'll see it used is for gram-negative coverage when we can't use a beta-lactam due to some kind of penicillin allergy or beta-lactam allergy. And that's really all that I need to say about Astrina. Hello. Yeah, it's, um, I would call it, it, it it's going to depend on the institution. It's going to depend on the area here. Uh, my institution has still got really great coverage. I think in the Kansas City area, it's still got pretty good coverage. <coughs> Detroit, go to Detroit, and you basically need to start pouring bleach on people. So everything's resistant there. Um, but here locally, we still have pretty good uh, susceptibility patterns for that street. It is the primary concern with that shooting end, though, is that consistency for coverage. But for the most part, it's not good coverage. All right, <clears throat> glycopeptides. Does anyone need a break? You guys need like a two minute brain dump before we move into the glycopeptides? Okay, we need some more like ACDC. Smoke <laughs> back up. All right, glycopeptides um, are vancomycin and telomicin, okay? You can see that these are just huge old big dudes, right? Uh, so they're big old sugar molecules is what they are. And because they're so large, um, it inhibits their ability to cross into cross the porin channels that gram-negative pathogens have in order for it to get to those peptidoglycan cell wall layers. And so that's why they are mainly active against gram-positive pathogens is because they can't even get in to start causing problems in gram-negative pathogens. Also because they're so large, they don't cross the blood-brain barrier very well. So that's why when we add mycomycin for meningitis, uh, we also have to have that rosetin there because we don't get great penetration into the meninges, into the CNS uh, with uh, vancomycin. And then it's also because they are sugar moieties uh, just like lactulose, when you give lactulose, it's a sugar, right? It stays in the gut. When we give vancomycin orally, it's going to stay in the gut, so it doesn't have systemic absorption. Um, so that's why we have no PO versions for systemic MRSA infections uh, with vancomycin. Great for C. diff because C. diff stays in the gut, and so vancomycin is going to stay in the gut and hang out and take it out. Um, but otherwise, we have to use it for systemic infections. Question Yep. Huh? Would you still use the rosepin? Is that what you said? No, you go ahead and take it off. Because you're not going to get MRSA coverage with it. Yeah, just go ahead and take that off. Um, you may uh, you know, consider adding on like a dexamethasone, or you would definitely pull off the dexamethasone in that case, because you want those meninges to stay in play, opening up permeability to the meninges so your bank might have to have as much penetration as possible. If you found that uh, the patient wasn't responding, uh, you would have the potential for giving intrafecal vancomycin. So you just uh, you put a port in the meninges um, and just give the drug intrathecally. Make sure you get good concentrations that way. There's a, a, a good review paper by Longwell and Young on that. <laughs> All right. So vancomycin uh, inhibits the cell wall cross-linking, so it acts like a beta-lactam um, from that standpoint. So it's just going to inhibit the cross-linking that occurs within the cell wall. 
Just gram positive infections for the reasons we talked about. Um, yeah, you guys know about vancomycin. What else do I want to say here? Oh, <clears throat> so its elimination is based on uh, the glomerular filtration rate in which it, um, the higher your <coughs> renal function is or the higher you're perfusing your kidneys, the more actively it's secreted out into the urine. And so that's why we have to dose adjust the drug is because as renal function decreases, you uh, actively push mycomycin into the urine at a lower rate. So that's why we extend out the frequency of dosing in those cases. Um, and then we're looking at troughs because it's more AUC over MIC or um, time dependent killing versus the concentration dependent killing. So we're really worried about where that trough level is versus the peak, which we're concerned about uh, with the concentration dependent killing. Um, okay, apparently I wanted to come back to that. Um, all right, great. So, vancomycin has been around for. Um, 60 years now, so it came out in 1960-ish, uh, 1970-ish, really started picking up its use, and we're still using it, and we still don't know how to dose this sort of thing. Uh, we've got an entire ISA guideline on how to dose a singular antibiotic. How stupid is that, right? Um, but anyway, it's one of the things that you want to be aware of if you end up in the inpatient um, uh, realm, uh, you're just going to be dealing with vancomycin, and that's just one of the things we have to accept. Uh, the main concern with vancomycin is this MIC creep. Uh, the MIC creep meaning that we're starting to see uh, MICs that are higher and higher than vancomycin. So we would call it good, good MIC, anything less than 0.5 or 1. We're starting to see more MICs that are 1, 1.5, and more specifically 2. So 2 is this concerning number for vancomycin. It's not the break point. It doesn't mean it's resistant. What it means is that uh, it's hard for us to get enough drug in the person without causing nephrotoxicity to achieve appropriate AUC over MIC values. Um, so it's been proposed that we need to have an AUC over MIC value of 400. And when we look at dosing the drug, we would basically have to give a continuous infusion in order to achieve that consistently. <coughs> uh, so that's the main concern with the MIC creep is when you get MICs up to. So when you get an MIC of two, you look at the patient, are they getting better, or are they not getting better? If they're getting better, just keep rocking the vancomycin. Uh, if they're not getting better, switch to something else that covers the mark today. Hetero resistance, with, uh, sometimes you'll just read that, it, what, the way that would be read is it's the lowercase h, visa, or uh, versa. So it's hetero resistant, vancomycin, intermediate susceptibility, staph aureus. Um, and so it just means that its MIC is somewhere between 2 and 4. So 4 is the break point for vancomycin uh, with staph. Um, so it, its MIC came back somewhere between that 2 and 4 inch, so it's heteroresistant and not going to use the drug. Redman syndrome, uh, remember it is not an allergy. It is an antihistamine release caused by over-infusion of the drug too quickly into the vasculature. So the vasculature doesn't like all that vancomycin coming at it so quickly. So it starts releasing antihistamines. You get red man syndrome. Uh, some hives going on, uh, sweating, uh, flushing. That is not an allergy. And so what do we do in those cases? Yeah, so reduce the infusion rate. Generally say no more than a gram an hour. If they have red man syndrome, then decrease it down to 500 milligrams per hour. Uh, you can give some Benadryl beforehand uh, to help reduce that antihistamine release as well. Renal toxicity is a big concern with vancomycin. It's far less than what was originally reported. So vancomycin originally, when you look at it in the bio, it looked like um, mud, basically. So it had all these um, nasty um, impurities in the drug initially. Uh, it was called like Mississippi mud. Uh, but now we've extracted all those impurities. It's much cleaner drugs. So we see less nephrotoxicity associated with it. Um, it's also, we want to watch the dose. So the higher the dose gets, uh, the more nephrotoxicity we see, as well as what are we giving it in combination with. Are we giving it in combination with other nephrotoxic drugs that would increase our risk for nephrotoxicity. So aminoblastides, loops, NSAIDs, just want to keep an eye on those as well. 
thrombocytopenia, I guess it has this uh, warning for reversible thrombocytopenia. This just came up um, the other day uh, on a patient that I was uh, working on uh, that had reversible thrombocytopenia in vancomycin. So that thrombocytic, good thing, but it came back up. So uh, it's a reported and actual adverse effect of vancomycin. Just rarely seen. Helvanson, it's awful. Don't worry about this guy. Um, it picks up V7 versa, so these resistant pathogens for vancomycin and the heteroresistant guys. It's one stale, it's no mantra, but it's not clean. It's not clean at all. It's got a lot of CNS disturbances, gives people metallic taste. It actually has worse um, renal function abnormalities, so when you compare it to vancomycin, it's actually twice as much uh, in terms of nephrotoxicity. Uh, you see renal impairments about three times as much, and it's got a, a, a rims for pregnancy. So anyone who uh, could become pregnant uh, at 12 to 60, uh, they you have to do a pregnancy test on them before you give them the drug. So I don't know. I just don't. has anyone seen it used? Okay. Even uh, so, if they're resistant, they're yeah, they're bad. Yeah, so uh, Zyvox has some literature for it. Uh, Septarolin actually has some small in vitro literature for it as well. So there's some other options. Dactomycin um, is an option. So we have other things um, that we, I mean, it just makes sense to go outside the class as well. Like, why would you use something in the same class? Um, so anyway, that's a big money loss for them. All right. We're moving into the next class. Who's excited? <laughs> oh, they're excited. They're pumped. These are my friends, guys. They came to watch me today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Bactrim, Trimethoprim, Sulfamethoxazole. Uh, they are inhibiting folic acid synthetase uh, in the bacteria. So, remember, bacteria, uh, for the most part, they don't. Um, take in folic acid like we do uh, for use. They have to manufacture their own folic acid, so if we inhibit the production of folic acid within the bacteria, uh, then what does that cause? What's folic acid important for? Yeah, DNA synthesis. So it actually leads to the production of uh, thymine, so thymine, the T on our, in our DNA. Uh, so we inhibit it in two spots, so the sulfonamide component inhibits the dihydro, uh, whatever, and then trimethoprim inhibits the reductase part of it. So we inhibit the synthase and the reductase, so we get no folic acid synthesis inside the bacteria. The bacteria cannot make new DNA. Awesome. We love that. So pretty broad spectrum. Uh, the main things that we're going to use it for, like uh, upper respiratory infections, UTIs, uh, we can use it for uh, skin infections. Um, it doesn't have FDA approval for staph infections, so you'll never see it as an indication in the monograph for use as like a cellulitis or MRSA coverage or anything along those lines. Uh, but we know just from literature and observation clinical use, it's a great drug for MRSA coverage and MSSA coverage on an outpatient basis. One of these like stupid pimp questions that every preceptor asks is, what is the dosing of Bactrim based on, right? It's always the trimethoprim component. Um, the reason that uh, it's based upon that is the drug is always composed in a one to five ratio. So it's one trimethoprim to five of uh, sulfamethoxazole. And that's because when it's broken down in the body and that bioavailability, what that does is it creates a ratio within the serum of a 1 to 20 ratio. So uh, this one, random 1 to 20 ratio is actually where we see the best bactericidal effect in terms of uh, inhibiting folic acid synthesis. What's up? What did you say that ratio was again? So 1 to 5 in the drug itself. So it's like, <coughs> what is it, uh, 160 to 800? Okay. And then when it's broken down in the body, it creates a ratio of 1 to 20. And that's the ideal ratio for um, inhibiting folic acid production. IV formulation, uh, there's a lot of concerns with like the volume and how you prep it. Uh, 
Generally, it's only good for about two hours after you start to prep the drug, so IV stability becomes a problem. So on an inpatient basis, um, you have to make sure that the patient's ready to get the drug. Nothing's going to happen between now and the time that you make up the drug and send it to the floor, because you have to run it over basically an hour. Uh, so it gives you an hour to get the drug made up to the floor um, and started running into the patient. So that becomes a little bit of an issue. Uh, a lot of issues in terms of getting the drug and being manufactured in an IV component recently as well. Um, so just some things to think about there. A lot, of, a lot of things to think about in terms of ADRs with Bactrim as well. So the most common thing is that we see is rash, uh, the rare Stephen Johnson uh, syndrome, and toxic, uh, yeah, necrosis, epithelial necrosis. So we rarely see those. Those are uh, type four allergic reactions that we see with uh, Bactrim. Uh, crystal urea and stone formation really are the main things that we want to be counseling on. And what's the main counseling point on that? Drink a lot of water, make sure they stay hydrated so they form less crystals that are able to wash those out, uh, those precipitates if they do occur. Um, a lot of interactions, well not a lot, but main interactions are with warfarin and phenytoin. So any of your patients on warfarin, make sure that with dose adjusting down on warfarin or getting an INR within the next couple of days just to monitor that. Uh, it does have photosensitivity associated with it. So we want to make sure that they're covering up when they're outside. Uh, during the summer. What's interesting is that uh, the sulfomethoxazole component, what it does is it replicates paraaminobenzoic acid um, in the production of folic acid, and so it looks like PABA. And so when you recommend a sunscreen for someone who's allergic to sulfomethoxazole, you want to choose a PABA-free um, uh, sunscreen because they're going to be likely allergic to it as well. can see some small increases in hyperkalemia and syncretin, and that's the trimethoprim component competing for excretion out of the kidney. And so when you have competition for excretion out, your serum levels of the creatinine are going to increase, your serum levels of <coughs> are going to increase. So it's not causing nephrotoxicity, it's just causing there to be more creatinine held up in the body. Third trimester, we're inhibiting folic acid, uh, so we're worried about neuro tubular defects in patient in um, the, uh, the little children in the womb, right? Uh, so we don't want to cause them to have neurotubal defects. And then uh, in our neonates, we're primarily worried about connectors. Uh, so we just talked about how you can have a buildup of uh, bilirubin, and the bilirubin goes to the brain, has a CNS defects that's connectors. Well, in children or in neonates, it's uh, very concerning because their ability to conjugate uh, in the liver isn't uh, ramped up to speed yet. And so sulfamethoxazole, what it does is it knocks bilirubin off the proteins in the blood. And so you've got more bilirubin hanging around free for metabolism, but the liver is unable to conjugate it, so you get more bilirubin buildup, more jaundice. That bilirubin ends up going to the CNS and you get connectors, which can be reversible, but uh, sometimes it's permanent as well. ADRs are higher in HIV infected patients as well, so that's a big thing to remember. Fluoroquinolones. <clears throat> so now, so those are all our kind of cell wall guys that we just talked. Well, we talked about cell walls with beta lactams. Uh, then we talked about our folate inhibitor, uh, Bactrim, and now we're going to start talking about like our ribosome. Well, this is DNA gyrus. So okay, never mind. We're talking about DNA gyrus, and then we'll talk about ribosome inhibitors. So fluoroquinolones. Uh, so this DNA gyrus guy. DNA gyrus is what uncoils DNA and then allows you to replicate DNA, read through DNA, and then make new DNA. Well, fluoroquinolones inhibit the DNA gyrus, so it doesn't allow you to uncoil DNA, so therefore you can't replicate DNA, so therefore you can't make new bacteria. So it inhibits uh, new bacterial synthesis. Um, it also inhibits um, like protein production, so maintenance of that bacterial cell. So from that standpoint, it also causes bactericidal activity as well. We've got Cipro, Levo, Moxie. Cipro is the oldest agent. Um, as we go from old fluoroquinolones to new fluoroquinolones, we get better gram positive coverage. So, Cipro, poor strep pneumo coverage. Moxie, great strep pneumo coverage. Levo, pretty good strep pneumo coverage. Um, Cipro, 
has great pseudomonas coverage, so it's got really good gram negative coverage. Moxie, not so good. Lebo, it's okay. Okay, so as you go old to new, less gram negative coverage, better gram positive. Old has the poorer gram positive coverage, better gram negative. Uh, let's see what the next slide has in store for us. Hmm. Okay, so it says that. Good. Uh, so you get better strep pneumo coverage with the newer agents. What else do I want to say here? So they're both 100% bioavailable. Cipro is not 100% bioavailable. It's about 80 to 100% bioavailable. So when you go from PO to IV, your IV dose is 400 versus your PO dose being 500. So we reduce the dose by 20% to get an equivalent um, dosage systemically. Um, what else? So both Levo and Moxie, no dose adjustments when we talk about renal. <clears throat> Moxie also has no uh, liver adjustments. It does pick up some bacteroides coverage, Moxie does. So no pseudomonas, but uh, bacteroides, good strep coverage. It makes for um, good coverage if there's an aspiration risk, so an impaired coverage like a nursing home patient with aspiration risk factors where we're concerned about some kind of anaerobe, uh, moxie would be a good choice there um, versus the rest of them. All of your fluoroquinolones have atypical coverage because they work intracellularly um, and most of your atypical pathogens don't have a true cell wall, so anything that acts on cell walls isn't going to work for an atypical pathogen. Fluoroquinolones work inside intracellularly, so they are good for atypical pathogens. Um, I wonder if I talked about adverse effects. Good. Uh, we do have to worry about the calcium mag uh, during interactions where there is uh, chelation that occurs with the drug, uh, so you get less absorption. This tendinopathy, I think, is bogus. Uh, but it's a black box warning, so there it is. And this is mostly based out of ba uh, Babel studies. That would be interesting. Beagle studies. Uh, so this was back in like phase one, phase two uh, studies where they were looking at beagles for uh, safety. And a lot of them ended up getting these tendon ruptures. Uh, they haven't replicated it in any kind of human trials, big retrospective studies, prospective studies. I think there was one case in like over 400,000 patients uh, that they did some kind of retrospective case review of. Uh, so it's not <coughs> as significant as we maybe make it out to be that you tell everyone, like, watch out for tendons and things, right? Because that's your counseling point choice with the floor for them. Well, they're pretty well tolerated otherwise, so it makes sense. So we know. Um, and then QTC prolongation is also possible with the floor for lungs. There's actually just a report that came out this week that I haven't had a chance to read. It's out of the VA and look at the centralized and four problems and both of them had increased uh, QTC prolongation, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, right. So primarily reserve uh, levofluxin for respiratory infections and Cipro for your uh, GU infections because um, UTIs are thinking gram negative, upper respiratory we're thinking gram positive. Makes sense. Man, okay. I think I said all that, right? Yeah. Oh, ciprofloxin, uh, we use this term, you may have heard it, like it's not a respiratory fluoroquinolone, so we use the respiratory fluoroquinolones for lung infections. Ciprofloxin gets great penetration to the lung, it just doesn't cover strep pneumo, strep pneumo being a big pathogen in the respiratory system. Um, so that's why Cipro, uh, we use it in HCAP and HAP for pseudomonas coverage. Uh, so it gets good penetration to the lung, just doesn't cover strep pneumo. Okay. Uh, so now we've got our protein synthesis inhibitors. So these are all going to act on the ribosomes, like the 50S subunit, the 30S subunit. Um, and remember, it's the ribosome that allows for uh, basically transcription of the DNA. So the DNA has been able to uncoil, and the ribosome is coming along and it's like uh, transcribing it into new DNA. Well, that's what we're inhibiting. We're inhibiting the process of uh, DNA transcription with our protein synthesis inhibitor. So proteins are synthesized by reading DNA, etc. 
Great. So these are all static agents. I'm going to have to probably fly through these. I'll hit back ones. Tetracycline, the main thing that we're using here is doxycycline. Uh, tetracycline, we've got um, uh, what do I say? a lot of side effects with it. Drug interactions. Menocycline uh, has a tendency to cause uh, dizziness. What's the technical term is eluding me at this point. But menocycline causes a lot of dizziness. Doxycycline doesn't, so it becomes our drug of choice in this class. Uh, no pseudomonas coverage, where it's primarily regular, uh, relegated to, is atypical pathogens, as well as animal type pathogens. So mycoplasma pneumoniae, uh, Clonidophila pneumoniae, uh, rickettsial infections, malarial uh, prophylaxis. Um, we do use it as a secondary agent to your macrolides in community acquired pneumonia because it's got pretty reasonable strep coverage. It covers atypicals. <coughs> two primary things that we're worried about for community acquired pneumonia. So we'll use it as backup in those cases. The main ADRs is um, what happens to kids less than eight when they take it? Yeah, T stain. So the tetracyclines have a tendency to bind calcium in the bone and remove that calcium so it demineralizes bone and the major bone that everyone sees is primarily the only bone. I think it's the only bone people see is teeth. And so it appears like this gray, uh, unmineralized uh, appearance to it. So it doesn't necessarily hurt anyone, it just makes it so it's not cosmetically um, whatever. And so contraindicated in uh, children less than eight and in pregnancy, has some GI intolerance, uh, it's primarily uh, esophageal irritation. So when you take the drug, it can cause some irritation in the esophagus, so that's why you take eight ounces of water with it to reduce esophageal irritation. Um, a lot of problems with manufacturing right now with the different salts, so I don't know where we're at with what's four dollars and what's not four dollars, like nothing's four dollars, five dollars, you know, it's just expensive now. Right. Uh, oh, vertigo. Vertigo is the dizziness with the There it is. That's the guy. All right. Wonderful. What's up, Raj? Sorry, I was just going to say it's okay. not that cheap anymore. <laughs> it's not that cheap. That's, yeah. Can't get the salts. Dang it. It's like every. Did you guys, you guys know that we can't get sodium chloride fluid reliably right now? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's stupid. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. Moving in to the amino glycosides, the drug that everyone fears for some reason. Do not fear the amino glycoside. Uh, know how to dose it, and then you don't have to fear it. It's like opioids. Don't be afraid of opioids. Just know how to dose them. Okay? Right? Okay. So, amino glycosides. <clears throat> Great for gram-negative bacteria. Great for gram-negative uh, bacteria. They're older. The main thing that keeps us from using them is this nephrotoxicity that can occur with them. So we know if we keep concentrations elevated in patients, then it's going to cause nephrotoxicity. However, we can use this extended interval um, concentration based uh, dosing for amino glycosides, specifically for gram-negative pathogens. Uh, so what we can do is we can dose them up at like that seven mg per kg dose, with these really, really high concentrations, right? And then just wait 24 hours before we dose them again. So it allows us to get the high concentrations, it's concentration-dependent killing. Um, just ramp up that killing that occurs. It's got a post antibiotic effect that lasts about six hours for gram-negative pathogens. It doesn't have that long post antibiotic effect for gram-positive pathogens, though. So it's only like an hour to two hours tops for the gram-positive pathogens. So when we use amino glycosides for like synergy with intercognitive or synergy with staph, that's why we have to use the traditional dosing of Q8 dosing, because you don't get the post-antibiotic effect with it. Um, so extended an interval, use the Hartford nomogram, take the level between uh, 10 and 14 hours, uh, you just plot it, it tells you how often to give the drug, and then boom, you just, you just rock, you just rock out with that new black side. So it's not that bad. Um, what else do I want to say here? 
that's the main thing on the black side. Remember, uh, when we're, we do a uh, peak in the trough on traditional dosing, so we want to make sure our peak is high enough because concentration is going to be And then the trough, we actually don't want to make sure that's high. We want to make sure it's low that we're getting it out of the system. What do you use conventional? Conventional is going to be someone with impaired renal function. So their cardiac clearance is less than 40 esque. Um, then you would use a traditional dosing, or if you're using it for synergy or gram positive. Or they have really, really awesome renal function. Uh, then you might need to use uh, higher doses more frequently. Uh, so, like, say, I don't know, like a young, <coughs> healthy person um, that drinks a lot of water, they may need traditional dosing just from the standpoint that their renal function is off the charts. So, they're going to clear the drug really quick. Macrolides. Again, acting on the ribosome, static, uh, it does exert a time-dependent killing. Even though it's once a day dosing with azithromycin, it just has a super, super long half-life, so that's why we can use it once a day dosing and still achieve time-dependent killing. Um, it does have atypical coverage because, again, it's, it's working intracellularly on the ribosome, um, so we can use it for atypical pathogens. Uh, what's nice about azithromycin as well as erythromycin is it does have this anti-inflammatory effect, um, this immunomodulatory effect that's really great for pneumonias specifically, so it reduces mucus secretion, um, increases the ciliary movement of mucus out of the lungs, so it helps people, um, you know, just uh, from a uh, symptom standpoint, improve quicker. A lot of 3A4 interactions with erythromycin and clarithromycin. Uh, so that's one of the downsides to those. Erythromycin has a high rate of resistance against, or H, H influenza has a high rate of resistance against erythromycin. So that's really why we don't use it very often anymore. It also has a lot of GI irritation. Remember, it activates modulin in the GI, uh, so we get increased diarrhea, um, as well as just GI upset in general. So we do use it for a motility agent post-surgery. So anyone who has post-surgical bowel obstruction, we use erythromycin in those cases. So we don't even use it as an antibiotic anymore. We use it because it's got fat side effects. That's great. Um, so azithromycin becomes our drug choice. Long half-life. Um, we do have the clarithromycin extended release now, so we can use it once a day, but it's still expensive. It's on its patent. So azithromycin um, becomes our workhorse there. Probably said most of this already. A lot of QT prolongation with erythromycin. Chlorithromycin has that metallic taste associated with it. Cool. Sound good? Macrolides. We'll come back to the macrolides when we talk about community partner. <coughs> Alright, <clears throat> Clinda. Again, ribosome, static, Clinda, ribosome, static. The main place that we're using this is for upper respiratory infections uh, where there's anaerobic concern because we get anaerobic coverage with clindamycin. Uh, it also gives us some uh, community acquired MRSA coverage so we can use it in skin infections for community acquired MRSA. And then, um, what else was I going to say? Uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> uh, so, primarily using it for upper respiratory infections and skin infections. Oh, it's also got that PBL toxin inhibition. So, remember, uh, with uh, MRSA, specifically the community acquired version, we get this Panton Valentin leukocytin uh, toxin production that causes tissue necrosis, uh, whether it be in the lung or in the skin. Clindamycin inhibits the production of that toxin. It's got some antitoxin effects. One of the big side effects is this diarrhea uh, that can cause a super infection with uh, Clostridium difficile. About a quarter of patients will have antibiotic associated diarrhea with clindamycin. About 10% of patients will have some C. diff associated with it. Um, one of the things to look at is 
dosing. IV dosing, we can go all the way up to 900 milligrams with the drug and give it twice a day. Um, versus the oral formulation, it's 150 to 300, and we give that three to four times a day. Uh, it has to do with GI tolerance of the drug. Uh, most patients just can't tolerate really high doses of Clenda, so we decrease the dose, give it more often. IV, uh, you bypass that problem. <coughs> There it is. Uh, Great for gram positives, we talked about staff can be acquired in Marseille. Uh, and robes. Yeah. Yeah. Same stuff. Okay. DNA synthesis. So it inhibits DNA synthesis, uh, so it becomes cytal in that case, so we reduce protein synthesis because of that. Uh, it does have, the big thing for it is the bacteroides um, coverage as well as the cross clostridium uh, coverage, so it's primarily anaerobic coverage that we're using this drug for. Uh, a lot of ADRs, the main one being this disulfiram like reaction, so we want to counsel patients not to drink alcohol while they're on the drug can change the appearance of the urine so it becomes darker. And then uh, warfarin interactions as well too. So uh, just basically an impaired dose reduction of the warfarin by 50% in most cases uh, is necessitated. <coughs> what else do I want to say about flagell? Did it work? It worked. All right. It was, I mean, it was right? awful. Okay. It was awful. I made the rookie mistake of using mouthwash. Oh, no, you did not. I did. Okay, so the counseling point, mouthwash has alcohol in it. So don't Massive use mouthwash headache. either with flagel. Okay. That's the headache the entire day. Okay, good. Bad. <laughs> but thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Alright, so flagell, anaerobe, C diff. Alright, I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. I'm gonna have to condense those down. We don't care about those. <laughs> it's straight up 10, close it. Zybox. The main thing uh, to remember about it is it's gonna be kind of directed therapy for MRSA <coughs> at this point. Uh, second line of Banco uh, can use it uh, for skin infections. Doesn't have any renal adjustments. Doesn't have any hepatic adjustments necess necessary with it. 100% um, bioavailable. Again, it does cover uh, Versa and VRE, uh, so it's got good um, use there. It also has PDL toxin inhibition. So if you have like a cavitary pneumonia, if you look at a chest X-ray, it shows cavitations in their um, lung field. So it would be breakdown of the lung tissue, then that could indicate that you've got a community card in RSA that's producing PDL toxin. Zyvox may be a more appropriate choice in that patient than vancomycin that's not going to inhibit that PDL toxin uh, production. It was originally developed as an MAOI inhibitor, but it was really weak, not good. Shelled it, right? The drug company shelves it later on and find that, oh, it actually does a good job of inhibiting bacterial growth. Uh, let's try it as an antibiotic. It works as an antibiotic. Uh, but we do have to be uh, concerned with interaction with uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, other MAOIs, and uh, because it can cause serotonin syndrome. There's just, not just, but about a year ago, there's a um, systematic review that came out that showed clinically is that really a concern? Probably not, but it's still part of the packaging concern, something that we want to be aware of. Uh, the package insert says that patients seem to have been off their SSSR. All right, for 14 days prior to starting the dialogue. Um That's not done clinically. Do you take a mock SSRI on all their inpatients? No, it's a complaint. Like, all docs say, hey, SSRI interaction, but 
with that paper that came out a year ago, my concern really drops on that. It's mainly just like a monitoring type of thing. If they get serotonin syndrome, all the effects are generally reversible. Um, and if you just can't wait on getting the drug for 14 days, um, especially if patients are uh, major depressive, you're not going to hold the SSRI on them and put them at risk for like suicide. Or, so it's just not good. Other uh, fun side effects, thrombocytopenia, uh, just mild suppressive states in general when you use the drug for more than two weeks, and then optic neuritis, peripheral, peripheral neuropathy when you use the drug for more than 28 days, we can start to see those as well. Dacto. Uh, so its mechanism of action, it causes depolarization of the membrane. Uh, so it is a cytal activity. And um, so like the best way to think about it is it's like it comes in with a sword and stabs the bacterial cell and like opens it up for all kinds of cells to come, or all kinds of uh, uh, cations and anions to come in and out and it uh, disrupts the polarization of the cell and it basically bursts. So, um, and what that does is when it stabs it and opens up that big pore, uh, then it allows like auto lysing enzymes to come out of the cell and then those act on other cell, uh, bacterial cells that are around it. So like it has an effect on other cells, not just the one that it acts on, or uh, bacteria. Good for MRSA, good for BRE. One of the main things to remember about daptomycin is what? Poor lung penetration because it's broken down by the um, surfactants in the lung. So we don't use it for pneumonias, but great for right-sided endocarditis, great for MRSA bacteremia, it's great for skin infections. The other thing is that there's reports with myologists increased CPKs, so we want to get a baseline uh, CPK, uh, and then Q-weak CPKs as well, just to monitor for any elevations or muscle breakdown of the drug. Also during that time period that they're on daptomycin, you want to hold their statin, because that increased risk for myalgias. Weight-based dosing, so we do four milligrams for skin infections, six milligrams per kg for um, blood infections. Some, uh, some providers, uh, pharmacists, recommend an eight to 10 milligram per kg dose on the bacteremias, because we really haven't seen a whole lot of these myalgias, or have those CDKs, that's the primary dose um, limiting concern. Thysacline, don't use it. No reason to use it. It's awful. Um, we've got really broad spectrum therapy. It's a tetracycline derivative. Uh, it covers MRSA, BRE, multi-drug resistant gram negative bugs. Sounds awesome. But for whatever reason, when it gets into the blood, it like runs from the blood as quick as possible. So it concentrates really highly in tissues. So if you have a bacteremia, it's not going to work. Uh, it also doesn't uh, have very good concentrations in the urine, so you're not going to use it for UTIs. It's got low concentrations in the epithelial lining fluid. Uh, it's static. I mean, it's not gonna, it's just not good. It's black box warning, so when they compared it to other agents for uh, serious infections, bacteremias, pneumonias, there's higher mortality uh, with use of the drug. Like, just, it just doesn't need to be used. <coughs> they compared it to Unison uh, for use in like bacterial skin and soft tissue infections. And the rates of nausea and vomiting were like 60% with tigacycline versus um, our beta lactams that cause the most nausea and vomiting around 6%. So, uh, no real use for it. Quetipristin, dolphopristin has VRE activity, has MRSA activity, rarely used, a lot of drug interactions. Uh, the only thing that's neat about it is that it's the combination of two streptogrammins. So, it's quetipristin, which is a streptogrammin, and dolphopristin, which is a streptogrammin. By themselves, they are static. When you put them together, they become cytal, so they are synergistically cytal. Name brand, Synergistic. Synergistically cytal. Okay? That's the coolest thing about it. A lot of mileages. Colistin, we're basically using it uh, right now for uh, CRE, carbapenemase, or carbapenem resistant interbacteriaceae. Uh, it was one of uh, the initial antibiotics that was ever developed. Uh, it's highly toxic in the body, so it kills everything, but it kills everything. So you put it into the veins, 
it's highly, um, highly toxic to your veins, just tissues in the body in general, nephrotoxicity, uh, neurotoxicity. Um, so it'll kill bacteria, but it's also gonna be really harmful to the patient. So we use it in really like end stage antibiotic treatment. Inhaled, um, used more commonly for CF patients though. Um, so less toxicity when you inhale, it's just gonna act locally in those cases, so less toxicity. Oh, great. <laughs> so Toby uh, is another uh, thing that we use for uh, cystic fibrosis as well. All right, let's take a break before we get into kinetics. I need a break. You need a break. Let's take five minutes, use the restroom, and get a drink. So we'll start back up here about 15 after. Sound good? Okay. So we'll rock through kinetics. It's going to be quick. And then we'll hit on allergies, I think, after that. about concentration dependent time dependent, uh, dependent and post antibiotic effect and I mean we've really kind of hit on this a little bit already uh, but it, it makes a difference in how we dose the drug more than anything uh, you know frequency uh, how high of a dose we're going to give how do we adjust the dose when we have renal dysfunction are we going to adjust the frequency versus the doses itself so concentration dependent killing uh, we are most concerned about main, getting a really high concentration of the drug. As concentration escalates, so does bactericidal effect in a concentration-dependent concentration dependent, dependent killing drug. Uh, so we really want to maxim, maximize the uh, concentration and avoid toxicity with those because at the, uh, the higher we escalate the concentration of the drug, the higher the chance that there's going to be toxicity there. Also because... Um, we're worried about the concentration. Anytime we need to renally adjust or hepatically adjust these drugs, we're going to act with the frequency. So, um, for instance, Levaquin, we don't adjust the, uh, the dose of the drug, we adjust the frequency from Q24 to Q48 because it's still really important to get that high concentration with the drug, not so much um, make sure that we've just got drug in there all the time. Uh, versus time-dependent killing uh, antibiotics, we're more concerned about maintaining a level of concentration in the body of the drug uh, that's above the MIC for a vast <coughs> amount of the dosing period. So here I have 50 to 70 percent. Um, that's pretty typical for most drugs. Is you, we just want the concentration above the MIC uh, from 50 to 70 percent of the time. And that concentration uh, is also should be about four to five times what the MIC is. So you've noticed that a lot of the MICs come back 0.25. 0.5. So it's not a high MIC, but we have to have concentrations of the drug in the blood that are five times that. So if it came back at 0.5, we want a concentration of the drug uh, in the blood that was 2.5 or more for 50 to 70 percent or more of the dosing interval. So when we dose adjust those, uh, it's probably going to be more about uh, adjusting down the dose specifically rather than adjusting the frequency of the drug. And then post-antibiotic effect. Um, post-antibiotic effect is going to happen more commonly with concentration-dependent killing drugs where we see some additional uh, cytal activity or static activity after the drug comes out of the body, uh, after it falls below the MIC. Um, so specifically like immunoglycides, quinolones um, are going to have that post-antibiotic effect. Time-dependent killing drugs can have a post-antibiotic effect, but it's far more uh, minimal, uh, which is why we can hit this 50 to 70% of the time and still have some activity uh, when the drug falls uh, below the MIC. So there is some post-antibiotic effect to time-dependent killing drugs, uh, but far less than concentration of any killing. So I made some other graphs that um, brought up. Uh, ran out of batteries. Huh? That looks fun. That looks like every other table that you've ever seen, but they're all copyrighted, so I had to make my own. 
but I had fun doing it. Um, so you've got, man, I've got to, I want to be tied over here now. This is awful. All right, where am I at? This is really going to be awful. All right. So you've got your drug that comes into the body, right? And the concentration goes way up initially. And then you peak, and that is your C-max up there at the top, right? Uh, and then it slowly comes out of the body. It's really excreted. It's hepatically metabolized. Um, and eventually you fall back below the MIC. For a time-dependent killing drug, all the time that we're above the MIC, that's good. That's where we want to be. So T over MIC becomes... Uh, T greater than MIC becomes the kinetic uh, equation that we're most concerned about. And then you can see there's some post antibiotic effect, but it's variable uh, with the time dependent killer. So we may hit a little bit after we fall below the MIC, but we really want to stay above the MIC for the most amount of time as possible. And so usually this is where we're going to give our next dose, is right about here, right? So we get this next peak that comes up and we're back above the MIC. So that's why when we have Q4 dosing, TID dosing, it's re really important that patients take it every four-ish hours, every 12-ish hours, because that's the point in which we're starting to fall below that MIC and we want to get the concentrations back up to ensure we've got good killing. Versus concentration dependent killing, we become more concerned about how high the C max is versus the MIC. So it's a ratio. The C max over the MIC ratio becomes more important. So we really want a high peak level on that drug, and then we're not really concerned about when it falls below the MIC because we get more cytal activity the higher the concentration gets. And then generally have a pretty long post antibiotic effect. So even when the drug falls below the MIC, we're still having static and cytal activity. Uh, with the medication that we have in the patient. So for, for basically that whole dosing period, you can see uh, we have activity of the drug. So uh, higher concentrations, greater killing with concentration dependent killers, so that's aminoglycides, fluoroquinolones, ketolides, uh, methadazole, and dapomycin, versus your time dependent killing, more exposure equals more killing, uh, so primarily beta-lactams is what uh, we think of there. And then you get some post-antibiotic effects with the glycopeptides, so vancomycin, clindamycin, azithromycin, tetracycline, uh, as well as oxazolidiones, which is uh, Zyvox, linazolid, and then the new one, tadazolid. So beta-lactams are purely time-dependent killing, so that's why their dosing becomes really important. Big interaction here is warfarin. Uh, we're most concerned about this 2C9 inhibition where uh, warfarin is metabolized through. Uh, so Bactrim, Flagyl, uh, primary uh, antibiotics of concern, and then our azoles uh, also concerning from a 2C19 standpoint. So those are the three that we get super, super concerned about, fluconazole, metronidazole, um, and uh, Bactrim. So there's some other things that go along with infections as well. So when we have an infection, the cytokines are all going uh, medieval, so we've got a lot of cytokines in the body fighting off infection. They need metabolized as well, so they compete through 2C9 for metabolism as well, so that can cause some disruption of the INR. Um, usually when you are sick, you are nauseous, you are vomiting, uh, you do not feel like eating, so you're not taking, you're not like sitting down for your salad after you just went to the toilet and vomited type of thing, right? So they've got less vitamin K coming into the body, so that's going to elevate their INR as well. Um, also, when we're giving broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, we're killing off some of the normal flora that's in the stomach. Uh, one of the things that they produce is a byproduct, is vitamin K. So we've got less vitamin K being produced by your normal flora in the gut. So all those factors um, combine, come into play to produce uh, INR elevations in patients with infections. So here's a, a cool depiction. This patient came in with an INR rocking out at uh, greater than 11, like it was so high, we just stopped tracking where the INR was. We got some vitamin K, slowly comes down. You see it took two days for that to come down to 1.5. Um, at that point, they probably started the warfarin back up. Uh, I think they were on some cortisol, something like that. Uh, surprise, the INR went back up. We need to dose adjust the warfarin. Just holding the drug isn't going to um, all of a sudden just magically make the INR be better. 
Um, so you can see then it went back up to 4.4. So uh, make sure that we have our ion components all, we have our ion flies all, we have our ion bactrim, uh, and we're doing dose adjustments to the warfarin while they're on um, the anti-infective. Uh -huh. So some other just general anti-infective updates. Uh, Chlorothromycin calcium channel blockers. Uh, there's a study that uh, came out in November that said uh, could be a uh, risk for uh, increase acute kidney injury. So we're going to be looking into that a little bit further. So look at uh, studies that come out on uh, that interaction. Uh, fluoroquinolones and retinal detachment that came out in December as a, a concern. So had two observational uh, studies that were done. One showed that there was retinal detachment as a possibility. One said no. Um, so conflicting right now. More studies to come. And then we talked about dorpenum and ventilator associated pneumonia uh, just coming out this month. Um, so pediatrics, we talked about fluoroquinolones um, with joint problems, tendon problems. Uh, again, I am suspicious. Tetracyclines, less than eight. Uh, Rocephin, because of what? Biliary sludging with calcium, good. Uh, pregnancy, no bactrim uh, for pregnancy, why? Yeah, what's that cause? Yeah, neurotubular defects. Um, let's see. Okay, great, wonderful. <coughs> Get corn benefit on that slide. Is that ever seen? I don't know. No, not really. Not very often. Um, nope. Okay, drug allergies. Certainly. You. you bet. Good. All right, allergies. First thing we need to talk about is what is an allergy? So we have adverse drug reactions, we have allergies, and we have pseudo allergies. Um, ADRs or adverse drug reactions are gonna be anything that is something that's predictable based on how the drug acts, what are side effects of the drug. Uh, so for instance, um, so for instance, morphine. We know that when we give morphine, it causes some irritation of the, of the vein. We know when we give micomycin, it causes irritation of the vasculature. So um, those are predictable, dose-related, pharmacologic, action-based adverse reactions. Versus allergic reactions are immunoglobulin mediated, right? So it's more based on there uh, being the fact that our immune system recognizes that drug as an invader, then attacks it, and then there's a hypersensitivity reaction that uh, ensues after that. And then pseudo-allergic, we really don't know what the heck is going on. We know it's not immune-based. We know it's not something that's pharmacologically based in terms of something that we would expect from the drug uh, being given. So those are allergic-like, pseudo-allergic-like reactions. So when we look at the modified gel and Coombs system, we've got four different types of reactions that can occur that are immune-mediated. One is our true Ig, um, IgE mediated anaphylactic reaction that we're concerned about. Um, so this is where we're concerned about penicillin allergies uh, actually forming. So there's an immune response in the body. Uh, the patient becomes anaphylactic. They have profound urticaria throughout the entirety of their body. Uh, we're not there just talking about like a, a small rash that can occur two or three days <coughs> out. Uh, this is something that occurs within an hour of uh, the drug being administered. So these are really acute and quick um, reactions that occur. So if you're given some, if someone's been taking Keflex 
for three or four days and then all of a sudden they start having a rash, that is not a type one um, IgE mediated true allergy that the patient has. Um, that would be something more like a, a type 4B delayed rash that we can see. Um, that is not immune mediated. We can reuse the drug later. Okay. So type 1 um, is the thing that we're worried about. Type 2 is IgG mediated. This is uh, has to do with our production of uh, red blood cells more commonly, so it uh, inhibits production of blood. Uh, hemolytic anemia is the most common thing uh, that we see um, as a symptom of that. What else do I want to say here? So the Stevens-Johnson syndrome and the tumor, uh, the, uh, what did I call that earlier? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, the necrosis, um, those toxic epithelial necrosis. You guys led me astray, it's not tissue. Toxic epithelial necrosis. Those are type 4C uh, allergic reactions. Um, and primarily with sulfonamides that we're concerned about those. So Bactrim is the main thing we're concerned about uh, there. Uh, those would be contraindicated for reuse, um, obviously. So you can see future use question mark uh, column over there. Uh, if they have a true IgE anaphylactic reaction, we can desensitize them, give them small increasing doses over a long period of time uh, to remove that allergic reaction. Generally, we're not gonna do that because uh, it, it is a risky thing um, at that point because they can have an anaphylactic reaction to small doses um, and then not respond to our interventions. So we really wanna make sure that we've exhausted all of our options before we do it. Uh, desensitization, and then the rest of them are going to be contraindicated as well, except for the reaction 4B, um, where it's just a small delayed reaction that can occur. With the type uh, 4B, would mm -hmm. you expect that our oxygen is going to be here if they use the antibiotic? It can, but not all the time. Like when they use it again, right? If yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one of the things about that is that if they do have a type 4B. It can be an indicator that they could later develop um, a true IgE mediated reaction to another antibiotic down the road. So it's just kind of like a warning sign, but it doesn't necessarily negate the use of the drug later on. That's important. That's important. So uh, back to where we're most commonly going to see the 4B. Uh, I've seen it fairly frequently with Kef with Keflex as well. So you can see that delayed reaction with it as well. Uh, the MP stands for macular papular. Maculo papular. So again, timing is really important uh, on differentiating an IgE versus an, uh, a delayed type four response. So within an hour, specific, uh, most specifically if you give the drug IV, that is gonna be um, when we see the true IgE mediated allergic reaction. Uh, if you give it orally, um, you know, you think about how long it takes for the drug to be metabolized and get into the circulation. Generally, that's gonna be between two to three hours at a max six hours. So if they have a reaction within six hours, that's gonna be an IgE mediated response. Um, versus the type two through four, which is gonna take days to weeks to develop, um, those aren't immune related. Or they don't contra um, indicate use again. So I'm going to start by talking about sulfonamide allergies, specifically differentiating between sulfonamide and uh, other sulfa allergies, and then we're going to get into penicillin versus cephalosporin cross-reactivity, uh, beta-lactam cross-reactivity at this point. So sulfonamide, uh, it's, we've actually studied this pretty well, have a good understanding of uh, antibiotic-related sulfonamide reactions versus non-antibiotic-related sulfonamide reactions. Um, You'll hear patients say, I've got a sulfite allergy, I've got a sulfate allergy, I've got a sulfur allergy, I've got a sulfa allergy. Um, and really that's just gonna require us to dig a little bit deeper as to, okay, what did you actually have a reaction to? When was this? What kind of reaction did you have? Um, sulfates and sulfites, those aren't real reactions. Um, I mean, we have, we have sulfates in our body already. People are not gonna have an allergic response to a sulfate. Um, sulfites, um, I, yeah, so we're not worried about those. <coughs> Sulfur and sulfa usually just mean sulfonamide allergies. Uh, so when we're differentiating between antibiotic and non-antibiotic uh, sulfonamide reactions, antibiotics have a sulfa um, aerolamine component to their sulf, uh, that comes off their sulfonamide component versus non-antibiotics 
they don't have that sulfa aromamine component that comes off that main sulfonamide structure. Uh, so that differentiates your antibiotic and non-antibiotic, and it's why we generally will not see cross-reactivity between an antibiotic allergy and a non-antibiotic allergy. It has more to do with the sulfa aromamine component. Uh, sulfonamide moiety is this uh, SO2 NH2 uh, component that really makes up the primary um, component of, of the sulfonamides. A lot of the sulfonamides we don't use anymore. The main antimicrobial sulfonamides are the sulfamethoxazole and bactrim, uh, sulfacetamide, which becomes a topical, and then sulfasalazine, which we use uh, for what are those things? GI problems. Huh? IBS. IBS, thank you. IBS, IBD, we use the sulfasalazine uh, for, so we don't even use it as an antimicrobial anymore. We use it as an uh, immunomodulatory um, medication anymore. Uh, women more prone than men. HIV patients, for whatever reason, have a higher risk of developing these allergies. Additionally, it just has to do with their immune response uh, is altered. Altered. <clears throat> versus our non uh, sulfonyl aryl amine components, which are diuretics, hypoglycemics, NSAIDs. Uh, so you've got your sulfonylureas, which are glyburide, glymepiride, glipizide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, COX-2 inhibitors, selexicob, uh, and then you know, furosemide, budesemide, uh, torsemide, all of your loop diuretics, except for epicrinic acid. Just remember, epicrinic acid is your non sulfonamide based loop diuretic. So, if someone who does react to Lasix, uh, you could use epicrinic acid in those patients. Um, great. Good? All right. So, here's your sulfonamide base component up there in the top left. Uh, you see your SO2 and H2. The R1 component is what we're most concerned about in terms of the sulfonamide cross-reactivity. You can see when you look at um, this little, uh, sulfonamide down here at the bottom, uh, what I'm pointing to is the aerolamine component. So that's your R1 component that comes off of the primary moiety of the SO2NH2, <coughs> um, which none of the non sulfonamide aerolamines have that component coming off. Um, so it's a benzene ring, it's got an NH2 coming off, uh, and that is what uh, encodes for the allergy that we see with sulf uh, sulfonamide, uh, with sulfamethoxazole. Okay, so just another depiction of that. You can see that everything has that uh, SO2, NH2 component, primary sulfonamide uh, base moiety. And then when you look at the rest of your furosemide, your glyburide, your hydrochlorothiazide, uh, your, your Celebrex, um, you can see that they have R chains coming off. Uh, in some cases they have um, benzene rings coming off, but they're not uh, the sulfonaeroamine components coming off, which only uh, sulfazalazine, sulfamethoxazole have, where it's an NH2 uh, straight off that benzoylamine. Uh, so that's why we don't see the cross sensitivity necessarily between uh, the two different moieties. And then why do we see the allergy that occurs? It has to do with metabolism of that aerolamine. So uh, normally it goes uh, through oxygen, oxidation in the liver, but sometimes that oxidative process can uh, get backed up, uh, whether you've got other drugs on board or you've got some liver dysfunction. Um, that can um, accumulate up and then it undergoes conjugation. And when it undergoes conjugation, that's what, when it forms uh, these haptin metabolites, reactive haptin metabolites. They complex with other proteins that look foreign in the body and then the immune system attacks at that point. So if you don't have the aerolamine, you can't have the haptin protein complex that occurs and you're not gonna have the allergic reaction. So we did some studies just to confirm that what we thought was correct. We, meaning medical community, I obviously was not doing any of these studies, but uh, there's a retrospective cohort study out of the UK 
um, looked at patients who had gotten a sulfonamide antibiotic and in 60, uh, within 60 days they got a non-sulfa uh, antibiotic. Um, and what uh, they were doing is just seeing if there was any cross-reactivity there. Um, and what they found was that of the, of the 20,226 patients that had a sulfa uh, antibiotic allergy, 9.9% of, uh, 9 .9 of them reacted to a non-antibiotic-based um, sulfonamide, but 14% of them had an allergic reaction to penicillin. So we know that those are two chemically distinct moieties, right? A penicillin is not like a Lasix. Right? They, they have no chemical structure that is similar. And your rate of cross-reaction between the sul sulfa amine antibiotic was less with your non sulfa amine sulfonamide. Okay, so 9.9% versus 14% there. So basically the conclusion out of this study was that, okay, someone who has an allergic reaction to a sulfonamide likely just has allergic reactions to a lot of drugs in general. And that is something that you guys probably see when you're looking at allergy profiles is um, they're not just allergic to penicillin, but they're allergic to latex, and they're allergic to morphine, and they're allergic to little lidin, and they're allergic to ibuprofen, and they're allergic to shells, and they're allergic to berries, and they're allergic to Tylenol, and they're allergic to anything that they've ever taken, right? So, um, so that's a lot of times what we end up, yeah, what's up? I had one of those patients come into my pharmacy a few days ago. She brought an entire list of all her allergies and her reactions. And one thing that caught me the most was the fact that um, she said she was allergic to Claritin. Oh, I mean, that makes sense, right? <laughs> so I looked at her reaction and said she had really bad diarrhea and nausea vomiting. So okay, and so that's some of it too. Is It's just this, again, this not total understanding what an ADR versus an allergic reaction is. And so we'd expect patients to have diarrhea on specific drugs. And so that's an ADR versus an allergic reaction that would prohibit them from having the drug again in the future. Um, all right, so that's that study, and that's that. Um, so sulfites, sulfur, sulfates does not lead to a reaction with a sulfonamide. Um, History of allergies may make someone uh, at higher risk of having an aller uh, sulfa allergy. And then um, the other thing is to look at what kind of allergic response they had with the Bactrim. Was it something that happened three or four days after starting the drug, seven days? Uh, was it a delayed reaction? So is it more of a type four um, reaction versus a type one IgE mated reaction as well? Questions on the sulfonamide allergies. So basically, like, what are you guys going to do with that clinically? If you see someone with a, that pops up as having a Lasix allergy on a profile and they come in with Bactrim, you're not going to have a concern there that there's a direct cross allergenicity there. Um, you would certainly give them a warning, hey, I see you have allergies. Something that you want, might want to be aware of is it also if you can't breathe, uh, go somewhere or have someone come to you, that one, one. Um, but if, from a medical legal liability standpoint, from using clinical judgment, uh, that is not a definitive cross sensitivity. All right, so back, back to these guys again. Um, so we've got all our beta-lactams. They've got that beta-lactam ring. I don't know if I circled them or not. It did, wonderful. Uh, so your beta-lactam ring, which makes them all similar. So the question is, is do we have cross-sensitivity with allergies uh, with these guys? And you can see your monobactam isn't quite similar, so we know that we're not going to have cross-sensitivity uh, with the aztreonam uh, there, which is why we use it in penicillin allergic patients and which, uh, times which we need to cover for gram-negative rods. So it's the most common allergy reported by patients. 10% uh, of the population reports a penicillin allergy. Uh, but only 10% of those patients actually test positive for having penicillin allergy when you do a skin reaction test. Some of that can be, um, it's not 100% sensitive, 100% accurate, but it does tell us that maybe most of these patients that have had a penicillin allergy had an adverse drug reaction versus a true IgE-mediated penicillin allergy that would restrict them from getting the drug ever again. So 
So I think this is pretty baller, this third bullet here. Uh, antibodies to penicillin to actually decrease over time. Uh, so there's a study done that looked at uh, rates of skin reaction uh, over time, and every year about 10% of the population uh, loses that penicillin allergy that they had. And so uh, at the end of 10 years, 78% of the patients uh, tested negative for skin allergy that initially tested positive for that penicillin skin allergy. So it can be time dependent. So uh, for instance, uh, when we ask a lot of our elderly patients, uh, when did you have your penicillin allergy? Oh, you know, I can't remember what I had. And okay, we're gonna give you one. Uh, so the classic teaching is that about 10% of patients that have a penicillin allergy will cross-react to a cephalosporin. Um, this is based on a number of studies from the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and a lot of those studies actually showed a cross-reactivity of about 5%, five, uh, 5 to 7%. But there was this one study that looked at 20 patients, so it was a really low number of patients. Um, and nearly a quarter of those patients reacted, had a cross-reactivity. So then we add that back in, we average that into all of our other uh, percentages, and that bolsters it up to 10%. So um, that's where our classic teaching comes from, 10%. Uh, I'm going to tell you that it's not that high, is what I'm getting at. <clears throat> so what it does is it leads us to avoiding cephalosporin use, uh, using more broad spectrum antibiotics. Using more broad spectrum antibiotics is going to lead to more resistance. Um, and so uh, we want to try and use cephalosporins in patients uh, when possible. So let's take a closer look at this. You like my magnifying glass? Huh? Yeah. Okay. So we've got these beta-lactam rings um, that are the primary concern. Well, I mean, if the reaction is to the beta-lactam ring, then we should have reactions to carbapenems and cephalosporins, right? Um, so we, we say, well, avoid all penicillins then. Um, beta-lactams, we're probably going to have um, a crash cross reactivity too, so cephalosporins, carbapenems, but monobactams doesn't look quite the same, so it's okay to use those, right? Well, not quite the case. So we're going to be able to use some uh, of these beta lactam ring um, containing uh, products. So cephalosporins, carbapenems, we're going to be able to use those um, as we're going to see here. All right. So what we've found is that it's probably more related to this R1 structure, R1 moiety coming off the primary uh, beta-lactam moiety that becomes problem in ter problematic in terms of cross-reactivity from, from a penicillin to a cephalosporin. Um, so when we look at that R1 side chain that comes off of cephalosporins, uh, as well as penicillins, is that it's only really the first generation cephalosporins that share the same R1 uh, side chain, and I've got that highlighted there. I don't know what the heck that stands for, but it's an R1 side chain. I mean, when you look at our um, high cross reaction cephalosporins, we're really just looking at Keflex as one of the main agents that we're concerned about. Uh, the rest of them we're not using with a high degree of frequency. Um, so we do want to have some uh, awareness of not using Keflex in these patients with penicillin allergies. I've got studies. So they've done some retrospective cohort studies. There's a hospital with 606 patients with a penicillin allergy, and then that got a cephalosporin administered after that. Uh, there's only one cephalosporin ADR, so that was an adverse drug reaction. It was not an al allergic reaction. So 0.17% had um, an adverse drug reaction. And then um, only 16 of the, of the entire charts had um, a cephalosporin uh, adverse drug reaction, so only 0.07% um, had an ADR there. So really a very low frequency in terms of cephalosporin adverse drug reactions, uh, lower frequency of allergies. We will look at someone who has a penicillin allergy and then seeing the cephalosporin. Next one is 413 patients, uh, and there was only one possible reaction to ANSEP. So these are patients that had a history of penicillin allergy, we gave them an ANSEP pre-op to prevent that staph and strep infection. Um, and only one patient had a possible reaction, and that was a patient who uh, they didn't have any data on. So they said, well, he could have had a reaction, we can't say he didn't have a reaction. But all the other patients didn't have a reaction. Uh, and then we've got this next study that looked at, uh, I think this was out of the UK as well, 
uh, community-based uh, study that looked at patients who had gotten a prescription for a penicillin and then within the next 60 days had gotten a prescription for a cephalosporin. Uh, 534,000 patients in this study, uh, 3,000, nearly 4,000 had a reaction to penicillin, and then only 43 of those 4,000 uh, then had a subsequent cephalosporin reaction, so that's only 1%. Not 10%. Uh, so in total, we've got 45 events of 4,826 penicillin allergies, which comes out to an average of less than 1% problem with a penicillin to a cephalosporin. Um, so I'd say the chance of someone having an allergy to any drug is probably around 1%. Right? So our, our overall concern for a cross-reaction from a penicillin allergic patient to a cephalosporin, to someone we're giving a cephalosporin, is very low. It's really going to be restricted to our um, first generation, possibly second generation cephalosporins, which have uh, the most similarity. Yes? Do you know if those studies look at first generation or look at any I think it broke it down. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head how that broke down. Yeah. Um, there was a, another study that did look at um, generation specific. And first generation had an odds ratio of 3.73 for cross uh, react uh, reactivity. Uh, second generation had a cross reactivity of 1.38. Um, and then the third generation was negligible, fourth generation was negligible. So as our generations get further down, the R chain changes more, uh, there's less of that cross sensitivity. So the main thing is first generation. So. Hmm. Carbophenous. Uh, so initially we saw some reports of like 47%. Uh, good thing those were not good reports. So current estimates is less than 2% of patients will have <laughs> a cross sensitivity between a penicillin and a carbapenem. Um, we don't have any studies looking at imipenem, or excuse me, ertapenem or doripenem. So uh, we do want to use those with caution. Uh, the studies are mainly uh, restricted to imipenem and neuropenem as far as cross reactions. Uh, <clears throat> But again, going back to when we use carbapenems, it's going to be someone with a history of ESBLs or that have a confirmed ESBL. And guess what? All we have are carbapenems for ESBLs. So we're probably going to take the risk and treat them with carbapenem with a crash reactivity rate of less than 2% so that they don't die. Right? And we'll have an EpiPen, and we'll have some antihistamines uh, ready to go, and we'll have ventilator tube just in case. And within an hour, we'll know whether or not they're allergic. Right? Boom. Uh, so, if a patient can safely receive a cephalosporin, we want to do that. We don't want to give carbapenems just because they have a penicillin allergy, because I've seen that done too. Like, oh, they have a penicillin allergy, we can't use cephalosporin, so let's use a carbapenem. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, so fast. Okay? So, when we're looking at allergies, there are some basic questions that we do need to be asking patients, and this is really a key role that you guys can play is uh, allergy assessment. How old were they when they had a reaction? Um, can you have them describe that reaction? Was it hives? Was it full body hives? Was it anaphylaxis? When did it occur? Was it after the first dose? Was it after 10 doses, 10 days in? Uh, was it orally or IV so it can help you understand that time frame better? Uh, were there any concomitant meds being administered that we could relate that allergy or that ADR to? And then um, what happened when we stopped antibiotics? So did the allergy go away? Did they get better? Um, and have they had any antibiotics since then that we could say, oh, they're penicillin, penicillin allergic, but they just had like ANSA pre-op the other day, so we're going to feel fine giving them third or fourth generation cephalosporin. Great. We good? All right. All right, so now we're going to look at bacteria specifically. So we talked about drugs, now we're going to talk about the bacteria that they treat. Uh, we're going to look at gram positive, gram negative, and atypical pathogens, uh, and then a couple anaerobes as well. So gram positive, remember they stay in blue underneath the gram stain uh, because their cell wall allows them to hold on to that stain. Uh, the gram negatives, the initial stain washes away because it's got that lipophilic outside, so it washes away. Then we use the stain with the lipophilic stain, then it stays on pink. Uh, we differentiate gram negative versus gram positive. Atypicals don't stain because they don't have a cell wall or it's a really poor cell wall. 
Uh, so that's why I have to do serologic tests on them, and that's why we call them oddball atypicals. We talked about this a little bit already, but I just want to give you uh, a visual of this. Uh, Gram positives have that really thick uh, peptidoglycan outer cell membrane, so it's like 50 units deep versus um, the gram negative, which has got the lipopolysaccharide uh, outer uh, membrane that helps protect it. Then you go into the periplasmic space and you've got a peptidoglycan cell wall that's only like two or three strains uh, deep. Um, so you can see that down here a little bit better. Uh, much thicker for gram positive um, versus gram negative. Uh, yeah. And then gram negative because they've got this outer liposaccharide um, protection layer, they also have porins, uh, which is the main way in which our antibiotics are going to be able to access the peptidoglycan cell wall um, and plays a part in um, like what drugs will act on gram negative pathogens and uh, <clears throat> alterations of porins that can cause resistance, etc. So gram negative porins and outer fatty membrane. We look at the breakdown of gram negative pathogens. Uh, we look at whether or not they're cocoa bacilli. Uh, bacilli, cocos, you know, rods, or cocci, right? Uh, most of our gram negatives are going to be rods. Um, GNRs, the bacilli that we're worried about, or excuse me, the cocci that we're worried about is Neisseria, um, and that's if we get a CSF culture and we see some gram negative cocci, uh, we're going to be worried about Neisseria meningitis. Uh, H. influenzae is kind of that cocoa um, bacilli area look. Although it doesn't usually stain out or culture out, um, so that's something that we generally want to do serologic tests on. So when we look at stains, we're nearly always going to see gram-negative rods uh, if there's a gram-negative pathogen there. You will also see enteric versus non-enteric, right? It's always labeled enteric gram-negative rods or non-enteric gram-negative rods. This has to do with whether or not it ferments um, the agar that it's on. And so if it's enteric, it's a lactose fermenter. If it's non-enteric, it's non-lactose fermenter. Enteric pathogens we normally find in our gut, enterally, okay? So it's in our gut already. Uh, we call this group the Enterobacteriaceae. So this is Klebsiella, E. coli, Ciderobacter, Proteus, um, Serratia. Those are our big um, enteric gram-negative rods. So when we see a gram stain, and we see enteric gram-negative rods, we're like, Ooh. It's not one of our resistant non-enteric gram-negative rods. Uh, so we feel much better seeing enteric versus non-enteric, because non-enteric are nosocomial pathogens, Pseudomonas, Tenotrophomonas multophilia, Acinetobacter, Omani. Uh, those are the nasty, highly resistant pathogens um, that we don't want to see in a culture. From a gram-positive perspective, we're mostly looking at cocci. Uh, we have very few rods that we're worried about. Again, it's going to come down to CSF. If we see gram-positive rods in the CSF, then we get concerned for listeria. Biggest risk factor for listeria is someone being older than 50. That's why we add on ampicillin and meningitis uh, when a patient is older than 50 to cover for that listeria. <coughs> Not very common, but we still have to watch for it. Otherwise, all of our gram-positives show up as cocci. So staphylococcus, we differentiated into coag positive and coag negative. Coag positive are going to be all of our um, staph, um, and then um, uh, staph aureus, excuse me, so coag positive staph is our staph aureus, and then the negative is our staph epidermidis and staph saccharitis. Um, so really positive, more virulent, that, that's our main concern. The coag negatives are the ones that we're concerned about contaminants, poor uh, aseptic technique around the blood cultures, right? Streptococcus, we break down whether or not they hemolyze uh, the blood agar that we put them on. Uh, so we've got beta hemolytic, gamma hemolytic, and alpha hemolytic. And so your gamma hemolytic is your enterococcus. We used to put enterococcus as a strep species, so it was like um, group D strep, but now we just made it like enterococcus. Like, you're your own thing, you're wicked, you do your own thing. So we've got Ficalis and Facium underneath uh, gamma hemolytic. Uh, but they show up pretty similar on a gram stain. So this is um, when we actually culture them, but when you stain them, strep looks exactly like enterococcus. So you always have to be aware of where your culture is coming from. Uh, so if you see a urine culture that comes back as um, 
gram positive coccyx concern for streptococcus. Your actual concern is for intercoccus because strep never infects urine. It's always intercoccus that infects urine. So you immediately think intercoccus, not strep. Uh, and then our beta hemolytic, your group A is pyogenes. Group B uh, is your that word. Your, um, and remember, strep viridens is over here in alpha hemolytic and pneumonia. They go together over there on the right side. All right, so that's morphology and gram stain. Then we think about clustering. So what's the big clustering differentiation for a gram positive coxi? Okay, streptus chains or diplococci, staph is clusters. So gram positive coxi and clusters, staph, gram positive coxi and chains or pairs is gonna be strep. Um, and then the next thing that we have to uh, have some awareness of is the sample quality. So if we get um, a culture that shows um, no PMLs, uh, which is gonna be our neutrophils, then we're concerned that we didn't get a culture or a sample that has any bacteria there because we don't have any white blood cells there killing bacteria. Um, additionally, you see many SECs, so that's another indicator that we've got a poor culture because SECs are just our screams of the cells. If I see a bunch of SECs, I don't care what those are. I care about what the bacteria are. So this rare gram, gram negative bacilli is not gonna be real. We've got no PMLs, we've got many SECs, poor quality culture. Next culture we have here is four, uh, few PMLs, few SECs. So overall, this is one of those cultures that you wouldn't really know what to do with. So you've got some PMLs there, you've got some SECs. Uh, these gram positive coxi could just be normal flora, it could be pathogenic. Um, it's gonna be hard to interpret that culture. Most likely that's gonna come back as MRF uh, or NERF, normal upper respiratory flora. Um, and then, because it's sputum. And then our last one we have here is Many PMLs, no SECs, and we're like, yeah, I can do something with this. So a lot of white blood cells, and so white blood cells are going to where there's a pathogen, there's no SEC, so we have no contamination going on there, whether it's oral flora or skin flora. We've got many mixed gram-negative bacilli, uh, so likely whatever we're seeing is a gram-negative uh, rod that we would want to make sure that we've got coverage of. Then in terms of uh, these coag negative staphs, remember two out of two is what we need to see for a coag negative staph. The one out of two coag negative staph we're not treating because most likely it is just a contaminant. We've got all kinds of coag negative staph on our skin. What's coag negative staph? Staph epidermis, epidermis for the skin. We've got it everywhere. We're not concerned about it. So um, just an example, this two out of two, it came back as um, MRSE, so it's resistant to oxicillin, and this is the way that staph epi is gonna pop up within, when it truly is pathogenic. It's gonna be highly resistant, not very virulent though, so you can see it's resistant to everything except vancomycin, and vancomycin has an MIC of two, so it is a more resistant strain. Um, and then when we look down here at our one out of two, uh, it's just contaminant, one out of two, uh, we're gonna redraw blood cultures to see if we can get a better result. I'm probably gonna breeze through this. Different tests for susceptibility. We don't use Kirby Bauer anymore because no one used calipers in the lab. Um, this is what we use most commonly to determine susceptibilities. So what you can kind of see here is you're going from high concentrations to low concentrations. Uh, and here at the lower concentration, you've got a lot of cloudiness in here in these uh, little uh, wells that have drug in them. And so as you move to higher concentrations, you see less microbial growth. And so the first well in which you don't see any microbial growth, that's gonna be your MIC. Your minimum inhibitory concentration is boom, right there. So it's the smallest amount of drug that will inhibit the growth of the pathogen. So here, this antibiotic is resistant because it's all welled up, all got nastiness in there. Um, same with this bottom one as well, in the well. <coughs> E-test is uh, another way that we can to test, uh, to test, test susceptibilities. Um, this is one of the primary ways in which we test for staph aureus. You can see that this is an antibiotic impregnated 
um, little thing. I can remember the name of bacteria, but not normal objects. <laughs> what are these things called? A piece of paper, maybe. Slip. That'll work for now. So it's an uh, antibiotic impregnated paper slip. And you can see that the higher concentrations of the drug are towards the top part of the antibiotic impregnated paper slip. And then the lower concentrations towards the bottom. And as your concentrations get lower, you see less inhibition of the bacteria. It starts to grow. And wherever the bacteria come over the slip, that is your MIC. So that was the minimum inhibitory concentration uh, for that drug. How do you interpret that? Basically, we're looking at S's and R's, right? If it's acceptable, great. Uh, we can use the drug. If it's resistant, great. Uh, we're not going to use that drug. If it's intermediate, we're not going to use the drug. Intermediate basically means that it came back to right at what the breakpoint is. Susceptible came below the breakpoint, R above the breakpoint. You guys don't need to worry about what the actual MIC value is. Like, don't worry about it, except for a bank. You just want to have an awareness. If it's less than two, boom. If it's two and they're improving, great. If it's two and they're not improving, change the drug. Otherwise, don't worry about the MIC. An MIC of 0.25 isn't necessarily better than an MIC of one. It's dependent upon the drug concentrations, the drug concentrations uh, that that medication can achieve, achieve in each one of the tissues and body fluids. Uh, okay, so in vitro versus in vivo. So we're, yeah. I guess you would have to um, ask yourself how acute the patient is. Uh, not how acute the patient is, but how acute. <laughs> uh, and, you know, are they in the ICU and just mildly improving? I'm going to probably change the drug. Uh, if they're on uh, just one of my standard medical floors and they're mildly improving, probably keep it going at that point. Yeah. It's going to depend on the patient and what kind of infection they have. If it's uh, bacteremia, um, we're definitely going to keep the bank going. Um, if it's like a lung infection, we may switch to a Zybox just to get higher concentrations in the lung. All right. Uh, in vitro versus in vivo susceptibility. Remember, uh, this is not taking into account whether or not the drug gets into the urine, whether or not the drug gets into the lung. So just because we've got MRSA susceptible to daptomycin doesn't mean that we're going to use it for a lung infection, right? So we take those things into consideration. Normal flora, necessary for life. I like that. I thought that was fun. Uh, so we've got all kinds of antibiotics, or antibiotics, bacteria all over us. Um, so uh, we have to have some kind of understanding that bacteria are just going to show up when we do cultures. But that's why we use different types of media for different um, specimens. So for instance, blood, urine, CSF, all those should not have bacteria in it. Those should be sterile environment sterile uh, so we can put those on any type of agar medium and culture them out nothing should grow normally versus a wound culture a sputum culture a, um, a, a stool culture then we use special medias that um, select for what normal flora we would expect to see in those cultures um, so anyway I don't know really what I was getting to with this slide but what I said was more important so common pathogens uh, from a positive standpoint, staph, strep, intercoxi, uh, listeria from a meningitis uh, standpoint, anaerobes, clostridia, and bacteroides are the main players, atypicals, chlamydiae, uh, mycoplasma, legionella, and then gram negatives. we've got the enterobacteriaceae, then pseudomonas, acinetobacter, H. influenzae, uh, moraxella cateralis for upper respiratory illnesses, and then Neisseria, again for meningitis. So, uh, when you see bacters in the primary name, that's going to distinguish uh, them as gram-negative pathogens. Cocci are going to distinguish them as gram-positive uh, pathogens. So enterococcus versus enterobacter. Two different pathogens. Please do not assume them the same. Different. So let's get into the major skin and blood pathogens, which are going to primarily be positive, gram-positive pathogens. So we've got a staphylococcus, which looks like a grape, it's gram-positive cocci in clusters, highly virulent and resistant, uh, most commonly causing our invasive infections, bacteremias and carditis, 
uh, single cell tissue infections, and we always look at it as MRSA or MSSA. Uh, or if it's staph epi, then it's MRSE or MRS, uh, MRSE or MSSE. So really looking at coag positive versus coag negative. Um, resistance is through uh, two mechanisms that you can have. Uh, primarily it's the PBP2A that encodes for that methicillin resistance. Uh, right? So we talked about that earlier, how uh, Seth Rowling picked up the R chain that uh, is active against PBP2A. Um, so that is the <coughs> primary mechanism in which uh, staphylococcus encodes for resistance uh, against beta-lactams. And then you can also have beta-lactamases that are produced against uh, nafcillin and cytosol in the first generations, uh, which are non-susceptible to beta-lactamases. Or, which, huh? Yeah, so it produces beta-lactamases oh, against our base penicillin. So penicillin, amino penicillin, and amoxicillin. So that's why I have on the beta-lactamases numbers in our cephalosporins will remain active against those. Uh, staph epi is our coagulative staph. Um, don't treat a single blood culture, but it can uh, be associated with our catheter-related infections and endocarditis. So if you do get two out of two, we're gonna treat that. Uh, we're not gonna presume that it's just contaminant if we get two out of two. Um, so this is gonna happen more commonly in your dialysis patients or chemotherapy patients in which they have a pre-existing port in which they can have that pathogen just sneak in uh, with poor aseptic technique in the dialysis session or uh, when they go in for the chemotherapy. Primarily methicillin resistant. So it's it's highly, highly resistant, but it's not quite as virulent as the staph aureus. Uh, staph aureus is more um, susceptible, but more very much. Uh, group A strep pyogenase, we're going to see it primarily for pharyngitis and cellulitis. Um, uh, also referred to as beta hemolytic strep. So all of our penicillins remain highly active against uh, the group A strep. Um, so penicillin by itself, rosefin, um remains pretty active, uh, amoxicillin. Um, so all, the, all of our baseline beta lactams will work perfectly fine against strep uh, pyogenase. Enterococcus, it's a jerk. Um, it's got short chains, so it's gram positive coccyte and short chains. We saw that strep, this last strep was gram positive coccyte in long chains. Um, right, so long chains, short chains, so that's a small differentiator. Uh, so that's why sometimes your strep can, or your enterococcus can show up on the gram stain as uh, gram positive coccyte and chains uh, concerning for strep when it's actually enterococcus in those cases. Highly, highly resistant. Uh, we only have a few drugs that actually work against it, so vancomycin. Um, uh, ampicillin retains some activity, and then uh, macrobid for UTIs would work. Facium uh, is more resistant than fecalis. So uh, fecalis, again, uh, this is the best way to remember, I think is uh, in Spanish, facile is easy. Fecalis kind of looks like facile to me, so that's the easy one. Facium, not so much. More resistant. I uh, primarily see that in UTIs and bacteremias. From a respiratory standpoint, we've got strep as a concern, as our primary concern, but this is the pneumonia that we're concerned about. Uh, it primarily shows up as the diplococci. And um, what do I want to say here? Mm-hmm, okay. So upper respiratory does encode for some resistance. So unlike pyogenes, uh, it does have some resistance against your baseline penicillins, uh, as well as macrolides and doxy and bactrim. And so we do have to have some concern in using these um, antibiotics against patients who have had a lot of antibiotic exposure in the past. So when we look at community-acquired pneumonia, we look at what their risk for drug resistance and strep pneumo is, and then we use like a fluoroquinolone or a beta-lactam plus uh, one of those agents. Uh, just to ensure we've got good coverage of the strep pneumo, which does have some penicillin binding protein alterations. Um, yeah, and so if it is resistant, it doesn't mean that it's more virulent. Uh, so it's just a pearl there. Uh, much more common in kids versus adults uh, because we've, um, yeah, great. 
onto our atypicals. Uh, they do not gram stain. They don't have the cell wall, so we can't gram stain them. Uh, chlamydia species, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, Legionella pneumophilia are our uh, primary pathogens that we're worried about. Chlamydophilae. <clears throat> we will. St the pneumonia component is the strain that we see most times. I think there's over 40 strains of uh, Chlamydophila, but these are the ones that we see most commonly. So from a respiratory standpoint, it accounts for about 10% of all of our uh, community-acquired pneumonias. And then uh, the trachomatis, which we see with sexually transmitted infections. And then uh, the cytosine, uh, which is fine just because we get it from birds. So if you've got a bird at home, you'll get that cytosine. Uh, if it gets in the bird, they can get the Chlamydophila. And um, we're going to use atypical uh, antibiotics against all these, so azithromycin is going to be our workhorse uh, against those pathogens. Yeah, it's really, really tiny, too. It's like a super, super tiny pathogen. Yeah, like this big. And then mycoplasma is actually the smallest free living organism that we know of. Smallest, tiny little guy. But it causes a lot of pneumonia, jerk. Uh, it causes like 20% of the community acquired pneumonia. It causes most of the upper respiratory infections uh, that we see in uh, school age uh, children. And um, most of the time, it doesn't cause a really profound infection. Uh, so we can use antibiotics for them, but uh, so walking pneumonia you see there. Uh, but uh, it usually doesn't require antibiotics because it's a non virulent pathogen. Um, it's more problematic in our elderly patients that have lost a lot of their immune function. Uh, Legionella pneumophilia, we just discovered it like back in the 70s. And um, again, it's atypical. We primarily will run urine antigen tests on it. We can see it as a nosocomial pathogen because it lives in water. And we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of patients on ventilators in the hospital. And ventilators uh, will have a lot of, um, uh, we nebulize fluid through there to keep their respiratory tract moisturized. And so you can have uh, Legionella that gets in there and colonizes and causes infection, so we want to keep our eye out for that. And great. Period. Exclamation point. Haemophilus influenzae. Again, upper respiratory infection, uh, gram-negative cocobacilli, <coughs> uh, which makes it tough to differentiate on a gram stain, and it doesn't gram stain that uh, well to begin with. Often produces beta-lactamases. It's really taken over uh, in a lot of the upper respiratory infections that uh, we used to see with strep pneumonia. So we started using the pneumococcal vaccine, the 13-valent pneumococcal vaccine, which has really reduced the amount of uh, pneumonia that we see in our adolescents. And so that's where H. influenzae is really moved into. Um, so it's like strep pneumo's little brother anywhere that you see that you would expect to see strep pneumonia. H. influenzae is usually there as well. And anything that you've used to cover strep pneumonia will generally cover H. influenzae as well. Um, there's this new beta lactamase um, resistance pattern that it encodes for. It's called the, the BLMR, uh, beta lactamase negative ampicillin resistant uh, H. influenzae. So uh, it, it just shows up as ampicillin resistant. So that's why on our new, is it otitis media? Yeah, on the new otitis media guidelines, uh, it's recommendation to use augment versus amoxicillin now uh, as first line therapy. Moraxella cataralis, diplococcus, upper respiratory. Great. Highly susceptible for the most part. Uh, sorry. Highly resistant to amoxicillin, where our cephalosporins, second generation and on, uh, have pretty good coverage of them cataralis. So think of those one together. Got it. Anytime, anytime you're thinking upper respiratory infection, strep pneumonia, H flu, MCAT. Like they go together. They, peas in the pot. They are friends. Mm -hmm. Respiratory pathogens. There they are. We talked about. Major nosocomial pathogens really get lumped into the escape pathogens. So we talked about enterococcus and staph RA. Um, enterococcus highly resistant, really mean. Staphylococcus, MIC creep. Um, A lot of patients nosocomial will come down with it. What did I want to say here? Oral agents, question mark, step down therapy. Oh, so whether or not you can use oral agents uh, is going to depend upon whether or not it's community acquired versus hospital acquired MRSA. 
If it's a hospital acquired MRSA pathogen, usually it's going to be resistant to all of our oral agents except for nasal. So step down therapy is generally going to be relegated to Zyvox. Um, if it's a community acquired MRSA version, then we usually have Bactrim, Doxy, and Clinda as options, but the hospital acquired uh, is usually more resistant. A and P is Acinetobacter, Bomani, and Pseudomonas. Um, highly resistant. Again, um, no stomach pathogens are not nice guys. I'll talk about them individually. Acinetobacter, um, one of the main things to think about it is that it is susceptible to the soul vacuum component, so unison becomes drug of choice. Um, even though unison itself is not doesn't have a isn't used for NDR pathogens in general. It's a sulbactam component that allows it activity against the acinetobacter. So if the culture's out there, we want to move to a unison um, treatment in those patients. So again, ventilator associated pneumonia, CRIs, uh, where it's nosocomial based. Lots of resistance. Pseudomonas, lots of resistance. Uh, it normally lives in moist environments, so in the soil, in water. Uh, so if you have someone uh, with a skin infection and they're getting hydration therapy, then you're concerned with for pseudomonas. If they have a diabetic foot infection and they're out walking on the beach, uh, then there could be a concern for pseudomonas. If they've got ventilator associated pneumonia, then we've got a concern for pseudomonas. So these are all environments uh, in which uh, there is a mo moist environment where pseudomonas uh, can abide. Mm -hmm. okay. And then there's this ongoing question about Double empiric coverage is really, we'll talk about that when we get to HCAP is whether or not we need to double cover for pseudomonas. Uh, if it's anything outside of pneumonias, uh, we definitely don't need to double cover pseudomonas. It's really going to be relegated to pneumonias uh, where we double cover that pseudomonas pathogen. Uh, K and E, Klebsiella and Enera, uh, Escherichia coli, fall underneath our Enterobacteriaceae. Uh, so these are highly, highly resistant, uh, becoming more highly resistant. It used to be not very resistant. I mean, we talk about E. coli, usually UTI is the most common pathogen that we see in UTIs, so not very resistant there. But we're seeing from an, uh, a hospital standpoint, an invasive infection standpoint, is more and more resistance there. ESBLs and now CREs um, that uh, we have to have some concern for. Uh, so Klebsiella and pneumonia, carbapenemase is really spreading like wildfire right now. Um, within hospitals, and we'll talk about that when we talk about resistance um, here, uh, hopefully before the break. <laughs> uh, Enterobacter species, um, great. So all these fall underneath your Enterobacter Lysiae, E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Ciderobacter, Enterobacter, Serratia, Salmonella, Shigella. All these guys just live in the gut normally, but sometimes they can go outside the gut and become pathogenic. Uh, e. coli is also one of those things that we see uh, that encodes for the shuga toxin. And the shuga toxin is what uh, is associated with a lot of our foodborne illnesses. So anytime we see like an E. coli outbreak associated with peanut butter or lettuce or spinach. Is there one going on right now? I think so. Um, anyway, it has associated with E. coli that encodes for shuga toxin. Shuga! And then Neisseria is just kind of an oddball. Again, if we see CSF, that's gram-negative cocci, then we're concerned for uh, meningitis, period. Stenotrophic monos montophilia, nosocomial pathogen, ventilator-associated pneumonia, think bacterium, period. And it's just fun to say, right? Okay. Nearly there. Anaerobes, Bacteroides fragilis. Uh, when we say anaerobes, we really mean Bacteroides fragilis. It's the primary anaerobe that colonizes in uh, the body. It's the primary pathogen that causes abscess formation in any kind of our skin infections uh, or osteomyelitis, any skin skin structure infection. Um, Metronazol does a great job of covering it. Uh, a great way to remember that is flagged for frag. Right? Bacteroides fragilis, flagell for fragilis. Great for intradominal. Um, a lot of times we'll differentiate clindamycin for above the diaphragm and flagell for below the diaphragm. So flagell covers more of our GI anaerobes. Uh, clinda more consistently covers more of our lung, upper respiratory infections. 
And then Clostridium, uh, main concern here is for uh, C. diff, and we've got an entire session on C. diff, so I'm going to bypass that for now. Um, Clostridium per, uh, perfringes is what causes the gas gain green formation. Uh, so when you look at uh, someone with a bad skin infection, a lot of times uh, when we look at the MRI with a CT, uh, we'll see um, a pocket formation, and it's like a gas gain green where there's um, a formative pocket, and then around that there's necrosis occurring with inside the skin. Uh, and so that's generally due to clustering for fringes. Botulism is a clustering component, and then tetanus is a clustering component as well. Let's take a three minute break, five minute break before we get into resistance. So, 11.30, we'll start back up with resistance. It's gonna be good. I gotta go to work. Oh, work! Hate it. Don't do it. Alright, antimicrobial resistance. This is gonna be kind of a fun section. Uh, this is a great image of development of resistance over time. So in 1943, penicillin comes out. Or in 1940, penicillin comes out. In 1943, we've got resistance to penicillin. 1959, tetracycline comes out. shigella has got resistance uh, to it. And so what you see is just this over time development of resistance to <coughs> bacteria. So pneumococcus, resistance to level uh, floxacin right off the bat. Um, so anyway, it's just something to look at here. Not anything life altering, but oh, also we've already got resistance appearing to acceptable. So, um, so you can see like the interval between when the drug was developed and when the resistance occurred 40, 43, 50 to 59, 53 to 68, 60 to 62, 67 to 79, 72 to 1988, so it was 16 years of that resistance. And with Penum, 85 to 98, um, have, we immediately had strep pneumonia resistance right off the bat. Same thing with these newer agents. So. <clears throat> when we look at uh, drug resistant pathogens overall, there's 2 million illnesses a year associated with resistant pathogens, 23,000 deaths per year. You can see that there's been vast increases and ongoing increases in resistant pathogens. The red line is urinary tract infections, uh, the blue line is skin and soft tissue infections. So, skin and soft tissue infections have fallen off. A little bit, but your urinary tract infections have continued to rise, and that's mostly due to the ESBLs um, and CREs that we're seeing. That uh, you can see that our drugs continue to fall off in terms of new drugs coming to market. We've only had one in the past two years, um, and there's several ways in which resistance can develop. One is a mutation. This is very rare, which a spontaneous mutation occurs, but it can occur, and that is one method in which uh, resistance can develop. There's also adaptation in which um, a resistant part of the DNA is taken up by another uh, bacteria. So one cell dies, its DNA goes out to, the, um, out to wherever, and then another bacteria comes along and like usurps it up and takes that resistance in, and then you can have a change in the PVP. And then there's gene transfer, which can occur uh, through plasmids and transposons. So you've got these little plasmids that are inside bacterial cells, a little round dudes and then transposons that have the DNA within it. Um, and what happens is those plasmids and transposons can be directly given to another uh, bacteria. And so this is one way that, that can look. Uh, transformation can occur uh, when uh, there's naked DNA out in the wherever. I don't know like where this all occurs. We were talking about this yesterday. It's like, so how does the drug chemical actually get from the blood into the interstitial, into whatever tissue, or to that exact receptor that's going through? Like this whole thing is so abstract to me, but we just assume that it occurs. So you've got naked DNA from a dead uh, bacterial cell that gets taken up by another bacteria, and then it has a transformation and it gets the resistance. There's conjugation in which the plasmid uh, that has the resistance transposon on it uh, goes directly over to the next bacteria. So when two bacteria come in, come close to each other, they can uh, shoot out this little pili, and then the, tra the plasmid can go across with its transpose transposon. And then the last way is transduction, in which there's a bacterial phage uh, that's basically a virus that in infects bacteria. And so that bacterial phage comes and it um, 
It like infects this bacteria and takes up some of its resistance DNA and then it flies over to the next bacteria and inserts that resistance DNA into the next bacteria. So that's transduction. And it's actually through bacteriophages <coughs> that we're starting to develop new antibiotics. So we're going to use bacteriophages uh, that encode for like lysozymes or kill DNA. And hopefully those bacteriophages will go into the bacteria themselves and like, start to kill uh, on the bacteria. So we're going to use those bacteriophages against them. So some of the common resistance methods is through beta-lactamase production. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about that already in which there's um, basically an alteration. Uh, well, it's just, you've got cell, bacterial cells that encode for beta-lactamases that can go up and chew, chew, up, chew the beta-lactam up. Uh, there's a difference between gram, I felt like I did this but maybe not. Uh, gram negative and gram positive, and uh, such that gram negative bacteria, they always have um, uh, beta lactamases available in their peptidoglycan cell wall. So they just have beta lactams in there. So when an antibody comes in and tries to exert its effect on the peptido, uh, trans peptidases, the penicillin binding proteins, it gets chewed up immediately. Versus gram-positive bacteria, it usually requires some kind of induction in order for the beta-lactamases to be produced. So uh, once the bacteria is exposed to the antibiotic, then it starts producing beta-lactamases. And those beta-lactamases don't go and sit in the cell wall. They go outside of the cell wall and try to catch beta-lactamases as they come um, and encounter the cell wall. Right? Does that make sense? Um, you've got beta-lactamases and a gram-negative pathogen being uh, produce, like they get stopped by that liposaccharide outer cell wall, so all their beta-lactamases stay in the cell wall, versus the gram-positive pathogen doesn't have that outer membrane to keep the beta-lactamases next to it. Uh, and then you got your extended spectrum beta-lactamases, so carbapenems, uh, drug choice there, we talked about that, and some binding. Uh, alteration is where we get uh, the strep pneumonia resistance as well as MRSA um, resistance there. Why we have increasing resistance? Because we use a lot of antibiotics. The more we expose bacteria to antibiotics, the higher uh, the more the higher the risk that they are going to become resistant. So in 2010, we had 258 million courses of antibiotics prescribed. Um, national average was 801 prescriptions per thousand people, so that's 0.8. Uh, antibiotic prescriptions per person, uh, which is actually down from 1999 when it was 966. So we've got pretty massive over prescribing. You can see Kentucky at the top of the bracket and then Nebraska or Alaska at the bottom of the bracket. So they're doing the best, but they don't have as many people. Um, also, livestock, use of antimicrobials in livestock can be problematic. Over 80% of antibiotics uh, used in the U.S. are for livestock. Um, and then most of that is then excreted out into our uh, groundwater and our streamways, and then uh, like you can undergo transduction and conjugation with plasmids and transposons, and those bacteria then cross that uh, those resistance mechanisms over to another uh, bacteria, and then that uh, can affect humans. So there's this big study uh, that came out at the end of or summer of last year, and it looked at um, high density livestock operations and uh, application of manure and risk of community acquired MRSA. And so this was up in Pennsylvania and they looked at uh, crop fields in which swine manure was used as a primary source of fertilizer and they, looked, and they basically separated areas of Pennsylvania into quartiles. Like this quartile didn't have very many crops with um, manure exposure. This uh, top quartile had a lot of exposure and what they found was that uh, patient people who lived in the highest quartile uh, had the highest and were significantly more at risk of developing community acquired MRSA, hospital acquired MRSA, and skin and soft tissue infections by 38%. So, 38% increase risk. So, we know that there is a correlation between using antibiotics in animals, livestock specifically, and then um, development of resistance. FDA uh, just came out with new guidelines for using antibiotics in livestock. Um, they're not like very, uh, they don't have a lot of meat to them, but they're new guidelines that we use them. Yeah? It did just come out, uh, a lot of their companies agreed mm -hmm. to kind of phase out these antibiotics. 
Yeah. Yeah, that, you're right. That, that was part of that. Yeah. Good. Uh, I don't know what this slide is for, but I think it's to say that escape is our pathogens that we're worried about resistance in. Yeah. So mm -hmm. staph, Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas are our big concern, the ones that we will run into the most that have resistance. And so we're going to talk about them specifically. Uh, MRSA mediated by the PB2A, uh, penicillin binding protein alteration through MEK-A, the MEK-A gene, which is on the staphylococcal chromosomal cassette. So when you run the genotyping on that, uh, that's the MEK-SEC um, gene that, that ends up popping up as. Increases mortality, um, and they found that fluoroquinolone use, uh, previous fluoroquinolone use has an odds ratio of 3.37 uh, to the development of MRSA in the future. What's kind of interesting about this graph here is that you see like overall MRSA pretty much increasing and then kind of tailing off a little bit. Uh, the, the blue is community acquired MRSA. It's gone up and stayed up and then hospital acquired MRSA has gradually gone down. Uh, in the early 2000s we started implementing a lot of um, like environmental interventions in the hospital to reduce transmission of MRSA so that's where the gowning and gloving started coming into play. And so that's when we started seeing a massive drop off on hospital acquired MRSA, about 50%. Um, so that was pretty good. But then uh, we already had so much hospital acquired MRSA that they were carrying it out into the community. So that's where community acquired MRSA really took off. And uh, while I was in pharmacy, pharmacy school, that's when like, community acquired MRSA like, really made a splash. Uh, so that was around this time frame, like 2006. So when we compare community-acquired MRSA and hospital-acquired MRSA, there are some big differentiators that we need to be aware of. Um, traditionally, we call community-acquired MRSA any kind of MRSA that was developed from someone who lives out in the community. Hospital-acquired MRSA, anyone who got it while they're in the hospital or getting dialysis or in a long-term care facility. Now we can't really use that as a differentiator because we got people coming in from the community with hospital-acquired MRSA and people in the hospital coming out with community acquired MRSA, so we can't use that as a differentiator. What we can use is basically the resistance pattern. So community acquired MRSA maintains a pretty uh, good susceptibility to our PO antibodies, so Bacterial, Clinda, and Doxy versus hospital acquired MRSA has maintained a high resistance rate to all, to most antibiotics. Additionally, uh, Community acquired in RSA encodes for this PVL toxin. It actually encodes for 19 additional tox, uh, virulent toxins that hospital acquired in RSA doesn't encode for. One of the main ones being that PVL toxin, and 98% of community acquired in RSA encodes for that PVL toxin, which causes the skin necrosis, and so you can end up with the necrotizing uh, pneumonia and the abscess forming skin and soft tissue infections. So, Hospital acquired versus community acquired MRSA, that has become blurred. There is differences between uh, them. And really, we have to do the genotyping arm to differentiate out. So hospital acquired is USA 100 to 200. Uh, community acquired is the USA 300 to 400. So when you read papers, uh, that's how they're going to differentiate those two out. Uh, different treatment considerations, PO, we've got the Bactrium, Doxy, Clenda, and Zyox. So not a ton of options from a PO standpoint. And then from the IV standpoint, we've got Banco, Dapto, Linazolid, Bactrium, Septroline, Quinapristin, Dalpopristin, Televancin, and Tagacycline. So a lot of options IV-wise. Uh, we will really probably stay with the, within the top four to five as what we would use from an IV standpoint. So we've got a lot of options. We're going to stay with the stuff that has the most efficacy um, as well as the lowest um, side effect profile, and that is uh, a little bit of those top agents. And tagacycline is not recommended for MRSA in the guidelines. MRSA guidelines. Moving on to ESBLs, these are going to impact interfractal ECA. Um, so Eclipsiella E. coli are the most common pathogens that will have that. What do I want to say here? So it's this extended spectrum beta lactamase that makes it resistant to uh, the penicillins that have 
your beta lactamase inhibitor, your cephalosporin that naturally encode for uh, beta lactamase inhibition in which uh, they don't, uh, they aren't susceptible, and then as treonam as well. Risk factors include diabetes, prolonged chloroquinolone use, and recurrent UTIs. From an enzyme mechanism, we've got TIM, SHIV, CTX, and OXA. So the first two are uh, point mutations that occurred. Um, this TIM was a guy from Greece uh, who initially gave us uh, the MRSA, but that TIM has about 130 subtypes to it uh, that encode for a bunch of different ES, uh, a bunch of different beta lactamases, and some of those are ESBLs. SHIV is one of the more common ones that we will see um, in the United States, but uh, CTX uh, is the most common uh, form of the ESBL in the United States. It accounts for like 60% of the ESBLs uh, that we have. And that has to do with the fact that it's got uh, this, uh, the CTX is named for the cefotaxime, uh, is where it was first kind of noticed was in a patient getting cefotaxime. There's a high uh, rate of resistance against cefotaxime. And I spelled stuff for people. Oxa is, so these other ones are, um, they hydrolyze the beta lactamase, or they hydrolyze beta lactams. The oxa actually oxidizes the beta lactamase, so that's where it gets, is the, gets the oxa component. Uh, so the bottom two are plasma mediated, which means they can transfer those um, resistance patterns a lot easier, so they can do horizontal transference versus the top two are point mutations, so the transference is more uh, vertical from one in the same bacteria to the next bacteria. So ESPL treatment is going to be imipenem and miropenem. Uh, caution with erdipenem, it doesn't have as good of efficacy against ESBL, so you want to make sure that you do have true sensitivity to erdipenem before you use it for an ESBL. Um, avoid cephalosporins, even though they may appear sensitive in your um, susceptibilities because there's an inoculum effect in which patients that have um, a higher bacterial inoculum, meaning they're like the initial amount of bacteria that came in was like really gross and large, the bigger that initial inoculum <coughs> was, the less effective that the cephalosporin is actually going to be. So if you do use a cephalosporin, you need to use high dose cephalosporin. Uh, Pipercil and Tazobactam, they have inducible resistance, so probably best not to use it. And there's no data on combination therapy for uh, ESBLs. This gives you a little bit of an idea of the increasing resistance. So the bottom part is uh, ESBLs. We can see that from uh, 99 to 2001, not a whole lot of occurrence. And then as you move towards 2010, you've got areas in which 1% uh, of the Enterobacteria of Klebsiella can, uh, of Klebsiella comes back ESBL positive. And then the top one is your carbapenem resistant uh, Klebsiella. Here in 2010, uh, again, you've got this rate of 0.5 to 1%, uh, 0.05 to 1% in the darkly shaded areas. So increasing um, with both of those. <coughs> So carbapenem resistant uh, Enterobacteriaceae, uh, still not a whole lot of these that we're seeing, 9,000 infections per year. Um, mostly Klebsiella is the guy that has the CREs. Um, this is from Dr. Thomas Freeman, who uh, directs uh, the CDC. And he said, we have a serious problem and we need to sound an alarm. Um, so like, hey, this is a big deal, we need to do something about it. Um, resistant, resistant to nearly all antibiotics, 50% mortality rate in bloodstream infections, uh, if it's non-bacteremic, then it's 30% mortality rate and 72% in patients with uh, liver transplant or uh, bloodstream infection. But that doesn't make sense. I don't know what that means. Was that supposed to be bloodstream and liver transplant? I don't know. I'll have to check that. Uh, seen it in 44 states. Enzyme, the primary enzyme that we're seeing there is the KTC enzyme, so the Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase. It's a plasmid. We also see some oxa that comes down and is uh, pretty resistant as well. And then the MBLs is your metallo beta lactamase. Um, and the main contributor to that is the new new Delhi metallo beta lactamase that's primarily relegated to Pakistan and India at this point. But they are plasmids, so they can transfer to other bacteria very easily. So that's the main concern with these new guys is transference to other bacteria. 
So how can we treat CRE? Uh, we don't have fantastic options, unfortunately. So colistin is a possibility, but it's got the nephro and neurotoxicity that we talked about, uh, spill resistance, and then how do you dose the drug? We don't really understand how to dose it best for CRE yet. Um, tagacycline is an option, except concentrations for UTIs and bacteremias aren't very good. It's also static, also has a high rate of resistance. Uh, Miropenem, if it's carbapenem resistant, how good is it actually going to be? But there's some patients who do respond to Miropenem in combination with colistin and tagacycline. So the optimal combination that we've seen in meta-analyses and case reports is some combination of these three drugs whether it be all three, or colistin plus neuropenem, or tagacycline plus neuropenem, or neuropenem plus colistin and neuropenem, uh, or something like that. So, combos. Phosphomycin can be used for UTIs. Uh, pretty susceptible. They're 80 to 90% in vitro in susceptible. So if it's UTI, uh, that is an option to use. Real quickly, phosphomycin, it's the powder that comes in a little three gram packet and we open it up and we put it in eight ounces of water and they drink it and then it's good for like 72 hours and we redose again in three days. It concentrates in the urine 300% or something like that, so really high concentrations in the urine. The last thing to talk about here as far as resistance is uh, part of the CTXM is now encoding for resistance in E. coli. So there's a clonal group called ST131, um, and so it's the O25H24 version of E. coli that now has the fluoroquinolone resistance that we're seeing from nursing homes. Um, and so it's just something that we keep an eye on. There's a study out of the VA here the last month that showed, uh, what was it? Like 70% <coughs> of their fluoroquinolone resistant E. coli was this uh, clonal group. Uh, so it makes up a vast majority of it, and they still had a, a, like 20% fluoroquinolone resistance among their E. coli uh, uh, pathogens. Yeah, all right, so we're gonna break here. Which isn't too bad. Well, I didn't have to rush as much as I thought. So we'll talk about, we'll get into UTIs, C. diff, pneumonias, like actual clinical application, the second half of the day. So let's break until 12.30, and then uh, we can come back and get out here at that point. Sound good? Cool.